Well, we'd like to, to welcome each of you out for this debate. The, the resolution that's going to be debated is going to be the charismatic gifts, including tongues and prophecies have ceased. For the affirmative is going to be Jordan J.D. Hall. For the negative will be Ante pa oh, try. i got to look here so I can pronounce it right. Pa Pavkovic. Um, so the way this is going to work is they are each going to, there's going to be two segments. There's going to be an opening, cross-examination, rebuttal. Then we're going to go into the second segment, which will be an opening, cross-examination, rebuttal. Um, then after that, we'll have Q&A from those here. Now, the Q&A will be written questions only. We're not going to be taking audience questions. So what I'm going to ask is if you try to write those questions briefly, uh, and in the best handwriting possible, we are going to be limited on the number of questions. We have 22 minutes for Q&A, which means if you write really sloppy and I can't read it, the chances are I'm going to skip it. If you write a paragraph, I'm going to skip it, all right? They need the time, not you. If you feel that you need to debate one of these guys, call them up and set it up. All right, so I'm going to give a quick introduction to both of them, and then we are going to start on the affirmative with uh, Jordan Hall. Uh, Jordan J.D. Hall, we're going to call him J.D., uh, is pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church in Sydney, Montana. He is a BA, from Christ, uh, BA in Christian Ministry from Williams Baptist College in Walnut Grove, Arkansas. He is an MA from Arkansas uh, State University. He's the founder of Pulpit and Pen and the author of many books. I think I was going to add the word amazing books, but that's okay. You guys could decide. Uh, husband and father to five. I had to make sure I didn't miss that one and say, you know, husband to five. That'd be really bad. Uh, Ante is the pastor of Christ Fellowship uh, North Carolina. He's a business owner and a leader in Operation Save America. So those are the two speakers. Again, the topic is going to be charismatic gifts, including tongues and prophecy have ceased. On the affirmative, we're going to start with Jordan Hall. He has 15 minutes. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to brothers Tim and Andrew for helping to sponsor this event. I want to say thank you to all you brothers and sisters in the audience. I want to thank Mr. Pavkovic for agreeing to debate this topic. I've been eager to debate the topic of cessationism and continuation, continuationism for some time, uh, but since Dr. Michael Brown labeled me too dangerous to debate, it's been some challenge finding a charismatic minister to debate me, and so I am grateful that we've been able to do that. Now, while I'm not yet ready to call this debate intramural between otherwise like-minded Christians, I do think that the debate will be edifying for those belonging to the body of Christ who listen. Now, as the affirmative of this debate, I have a responsibility to define terms so that this debate has an actual conflict of ideas rather than outskirting the substantive issues on the basic of semantics. So then, uh, a definition of terms as I begin. By the way, I don't expect my opponent uh, to agree or to use my definitions, but I want both him and you to know what I mean when I use these words. By cessationism, I mean the belief that the apostolic sign gifts have ceased. By apostolic sign gifts, I mean what some people call the miraculous gifts, that is the ability to work signs, wonders, and mighty supernatural deeds by individuals and through human agencies such as gifts of healing, relevatory prophecy, and the gift of tongues. By charismatic gifts, I'll use the term uh, synonymously and interchangeably with apostolic sign gifts, recognizing that not all uh, gifts referred to by many of us as charismatic necessarily have that Greek word charisma used in the original language. I do not believe in any distinction between the gifts of God called charisma and the gifts of the church called doria or any other different forms of these words. And if pressed later, I'll happily explain what I mean by that. By the gift of tongues, I mean xenoglossia. That is the ability to speak actual languages known to the speaker or not known by the speaker, but known by others or made known through interpretation. By the gift of prophecy, I mean direct and divine revelation from God to man and the ability to convey that revelation as God has given it. I put tongues as a subcategory of prophecy because the scriptures make clear that tongues is just that. It is the dynamic equivalent of prophecy. We see that in places like Acts chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. By gift of healing, I mean the ability given to an individual to work miraculous and supernatural
supernatural healing without medical intervention or the intervention through some other kind of natural mediation to heal an individual of a physical ailment. By continuationism, I mean the belief that all apostolic sign gifts have continued to this present age without change or alteration. By the term charismatic, I mean one who practices continuationism and doesn't only hold to that doctrine as a mere abstract theological or hypothetical position. That being said, let me explain what cessationism is not so that my opponent doesn't spend any of his precious time in this short debate arguing against a straw man which would be neither edifying to him, to myself, or to any of you. I believe, as do all cessationists that I've ever known, in the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is continuing his work among men in various ways. The Holy Spirit is still convicting the world of sin, John chapter 16, verse 8. The Holy Spirit is still leading us to the knowledge of truth, John chapter 16, verse 13. The Holy Spirit is still baptizing people in his spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The Holy Spirit is still producing in us spiritual fruit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The Holy Spirit is still distributing spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. The Holy Spirit is still regenerating generating the lost, John chapter 3, 6. The Holy Spirit is still sanctifying the believer, Romans chapter 15, verse 15. And the Holy Spirit is still illumining our minds to better understand his word, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Furthermore, in God's providence, I affirm that God still heals people today. I affirm that God still does supernatural things. I affirm that God is constantly intervening in the natural course of events and outside the natural course of events. And I affirm that God performs marvelous acts of providence and grace, many things that a opposing charismatics may refer to as miracles. However, to be very clear, what else I affirm is the historic and biblical doctrine of cessationism of the miraculous sign gifts that accompanied the work of the apostles, which were designed to signify apostolic work and apostolic authority. Therefore, I deny that any individual today demonstrates what 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, calls the marks of a true apostle. These include signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. Similarly, I deny that any are gifted with what is called the word gifts, which include the words of knowledge, words of prophecy, or the gift of tongues, all three of those things belonging exclusively to the apostolic church. Furthermore, I affirm the cessation of the gift of apostleship, which is not the only but certainly an important reason for believing in the cessation of apostolic sign gifts. Now, it's here that I recognize that such an important amount of this time of time in this debate has been spent defining terms and positions in the precious first few minutes of the debate. So let me be very quick with the reason why uh, uh, for my assertions that the gift of the apostolate has ceased and with it the apostolic sign gifts. First, charismatic gifts. That is, the apostolic sign gifts of healing, signs, wonders, mighty deeds. These were exclusively associated with the apostolate. As mentioned before, Paul tells the church in Corinth in his second letter, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Here, Paul is contrasting his position as an authentic apostle with the lack of these works among the false apostles, saying in the verse before, verse 11, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. Now with this verse comes the assertion that the miraculous or charismatic sign gifts accompanied apostleship. Now for the sake of clarity, please be advised that neither myself nor any cessationist I've ever met believe that the apostolic sign gifts were only given to the apostles, and so that term may be a little bit misleading. Rather, we assert that these sign gifts were demonstrated by the apostles or by those upon whom the apostles laid their hands to receive such, uh, such gifting. In fact, all of the New Testament bears witness of this. In fact, the best place to see signs and wonders accompanying the apostolate specifically is Acts chapter 8, verse 18 through 19. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive my Spirit. Here, Simon the sorcerer wasn't trying to bribe the apostles to receive the sign gifts. He was trying to bribe the apostles to receive the ability to give the sign gifts to others. If all he wanted was to receive the sign gifts, he could have received that from anyone, except it only came through the apostles the ability to pass that on to someone else. The notion that random and ordinary Christians in the New Testament were gifted with miraculous gifts is simply unsustainable scripturally, and neither is it explicitly stated in sacred scripture, nor is it logically deduced. There is no place indicated in scripture that non-apostles had the gift of healing. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 16, and in Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 42, we see that the sick awaited to be brought to the apostles, even though they lived among a whole host of 
Christians with diverse spiritual gifts. No one of the believers could heal them, but only the apostles, meaning that it wasn't an ordinary gift given to ordinary believers, but it was reserved for the apostles and those upon whom they laid hands. As the church prayed for signs and wonders in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, they prayed that these works would be done by the apostles, not through themselves or ordinary members of the body. The author of Hebrews says that it was the apostles, those who first testified of the gospel, they were the ones by which, quote, God bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Again, as facts, nowhere in the New Testament do we see ordinary Christians who are not apostles or gifted by the apostles miraculously healing the sick, speaking in tongues, giving prophecy, or performing signs and wonders. All such demonstrations came either by or through the apostles. It is, therefore, unreasonable to presume that the Holy Spirit is dispensing the charismatic sign gifts of apostleship today to those who are not apostles and who have never had their hands laid upon them by the apostles. Finally, we see the growing cessation of the apostolic sign gifts even throughout the New Testament. When the continuationist asks for a chapter and verse for cessation, like with so many doctrines, like the Holy Trinity, for example, that are deduced from Scripture, we would simply hold up the entire canon of Holy Writ as testimony. We see it inside the pages of the New Testament narrative. It's abundantly clear from the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the fulfillment of Joel 2, we see a gradual diminishing of the sign gifts that is directly correspondent and correlational with the increase of doctrinal maturity in the church. In other words, as the church became more mature, as its foundation was laid by the apostles and prophets in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, the less need there was for sign gifts to exist. And with the coming of the New Testament canon, we see a complete extinguishing of the gifts meant to affirm the apostles because the apostles were dead and God's word had been completing, uh, completed. Now, time is fleeting, and so I'll only give a few examples of this. By the third missionary journey of Paul. In 52 or 53 AD, we see a crescendo of his miracle working power in that even his handkerchiefs and his apron remnants were healing the sick, Acts chapter 19 verse 2. But by the time Paul was imprisoned in 62 AD, he couldn't even heal Epaphroditus in Philippians 2 25 through 30, having instead needing to watch his faithful co-laborer suffer an illness. Now, this was about the time that he wrote his first letter to Timothy, and Paul didn't send Timothy a miracle-working handkerchief or a a remnant of his apron or, or anointed piece of clothing, but he told him to drink wine to help his stomach ache. Paul's healing power had not returned to Paul by the time that he wrote his second letter to Timothy when he had to leave behind his faithful servant Trophimus in Miletus because he was sick. And I won't even bother you with the accounts and speculations that Paul himself suffered from debilitating illness from which he was wasn't miraculously healed. Now make no mistake about it, the one healing with his garments was soon unable to heal hardly anyone at all, least of all those closest to him, which is a far cry from the indiscriminate healing we see in the scriptures earlier as it says, quote, all with diseases were healed. That was 60 AD. But by 62 AD, we see cessation written into the pages of the New Testament as these gifts very evidently began to cease. Likewise, we see cessation not only explicitly in the narrative of the redemptive history of the New Testament, we see it logically deduced from the epistles. Paul mentions apostolic sign gifts only to the church of Corinth. Now, that is the third letter written by Paul. He would go on to write nine more epistles to six more churches and never speak again of tongues, miracles, signs, wonders, or prophetic gifting. As far as Paul was concerned, the apostolic or charismatic gifts were of such ceasing consequence that they needn't needn't even be mentioned by the apostle ever again to any of the other churches that he had written to. And this occurred about the same time that we begin to see in the chronology of Acts a gradual cessation of these gifts. Likewise, we see the cessation of the charismatic sign gifts repeatedly testified to throughout history. The earliest Christian writers like Barnabas, Hermas, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Clement write without any reference to the charismatic sign gifts, certain of them asserting its cessation. Among the patristic fathers who came along later in the second and third century, we only see fleeting references to vague hearsay accounts of miracles, with most like Chrysostom explicitly denying their, their continuance. The one exception to this is Tertullian, and he came up with such crazy visions as about how long the veils had to be with which he expected women to cover their face. The rest of the ancient Christian world considered continued claims of prophecy to be heretical and continued claims of sign gifts to be foolish and fallacious, going so far as anathematizing the Montanists to hell for daring to claim what charismatics today claim on a daily basis. 
Then we see a direct correlation between the increase of doctrinal corruption in the fourth and fifth centuries to the claims of signs and wonders. In fact, virtually 100% of the claims of signs and wonders from the fifth century until the Reformation were done to propagate Romish doctrines like the ascension of Mary and to affirm the blasphemous stench of the Papist Eucharist. Biblically, logically, historically, it can be fairly deduced, just as any other doctrine like the Holy Trinity, like the canonicity of the Bible, that the gifts designed to demonstrate the validity of the apostles ceased with those apostles and prophecy ceased with the completion of God's word. The term sola scriptura was first applied not to Roman Catholics, but it was applied to continuationists like my opponent, who believe in continued prophecy and ongoing revelation. That's why the term was made. Far from being a rallying cry against the papists, it was first a rallying cry against the Lollards and Anabaptists and the charismatics of that day who had been led astray by claims of continuing prophecy. Because I believe in sola scriptura and because I affirm that the scripture is sufficient, I affirm that God's word is complete. His apostles have spoken and so their gifts have departed with them. And his spirit, though, still moves among men in all the various ways that I've mentioned. I'll end by quoting the very one who is often credited for inventing the term sola scriptura as he spoke to the charismatic enthusiasts and they said, it's the spirit, the spirit makes us say these things, the spirit, and Luther responded by saying, I slap your spirit in the snout. Such is my answer today to claims of continued signs and wonders, not done by the apostles, but often done by children, women, a great many heretics, and a great many of false teachers. By tongues spoken not as actual languages, but as ecstatic gobbledygook gibberish, and claims of half healing, of invisible ailments, and unsubstantiated, unprovable accounts of the miraculous that only and always happen in the absence of a video camera and men who claim to control the weather but have never healed a single person with AIDS, or who prophesy of sneaky squid spirits, or who claim to have the gift of prophecy but are utterly devoid of the spiritual gift of discernment. That is not the spirit of God, but that is a spirit of a false spirit. And to that, I quote Luther, I slap your spirit in the snout. All right, well, my name is Ante Pavkovic. I am a pastor from North Carolina, and as he said, I also own a business. I'm married, married a woman with five kids. They've given us 16 grandchildren. Praise the Lord, I love Jesus Christ. He saved me from a life of sin and drug abuse. I was in a rock band, I had much longer hair, but when I met Jesus, everything changed. And he saved me, washed me in his blood, and sanctified me. So. I'm going to say something completely the opposite of what you just heard here, which throw everything in, the whole kitchen sink, and, and hope something sticks. That, that seems to be the approach here. The New Testament scriptures are a Pentecostal handbook written by Pentecostal charismatic believers for Pentecostal charismatic believers. There is no other kind of Christian in the New Testament, at least for long. The ones that are not baptized in the Holy Ghost with the signs that follow with the evidence soon are. But the only way to understand the New Testament properly is to know that Pentecostalism, charismaticism, is assumed throughout the entire New Testament. And so what we want to do is rightly divide the word of truth. I don't believe we're going to be able to turn to every scripture, so I'm going to have to do this fast to lay the right foundation. Paul said we have to rightly divide the word and that's what I intend to do. So when we talk about the new birth, when someone's born again, what happens? In John 3, we know Jesus said you must be born of the water and the spirit. It's a spiritual birth where we become children of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, he that believes Jesus Christ is, is the Messiah, the Son of God, is born of God. Amen? In verse 10, it says, he that believes in the Son has the witness in himself. These are descriptions of being born again, becoming a child of God, um, having the new birth. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what being a Christian is. You're made new. So we know from the Bible we pass out of spiritual death into life. Colossians 1.13 says we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness, right, into the kingdom of his dear son. John 5, 24 says that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we pass from death to life, will not come into judgment, but we have everlasting life. Um, 
Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, which many of the Calvinists here know full well, talks about us, about us being um, by nature children of wrath. We're dead in sin. And later he talks about being made alive unto God through Jesus Christ by grace you're saved by faith. So we know that salvation or the new birth is a leaving of a, of a state of spiritual death into life. It's a birth. It's being born of God's spirit. And when that happens, we know we're forgiven. We're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We're redeemed. We now belong to God. We're washed in his blood and we're actually adopted. So I want to ask you, who do we encounter when this happens? Who is the one that we encounter? Jesus Christ. He's the one we're crying out to. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Rescue me. Save me. He's the one we're encountering. He's the one that John chapter 1 says, as many as received him, to them they get, he gave power to become sons of God, even to those that believe on his name, who were born not of the following things, but of God. They're born of God. It is an encounter with Jesus Christ, like Paul on the Damascus Road, and we cry out to him, and who do we trust when we get saved? Who are we looking to? Who are we focusing on? Jesus Christ, and we're justified by faith. So salvation is a birth. It is all the things I've said, and there are many other things, but due to time, I can't present them all, what Scripture says, but I want to move into the rightly dividing part. When the Bible says that there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit, it is a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you don't understand this, the rest of the New Testament is not going to make sense, and what he presented may sway you. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not salvation. Salvation is an encounter with Jesus Christ, plainly laid out. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is an encounter with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist began to talk about that. He said, one is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's said in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. We turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and we find out there are six fundamental doctrines of Christ that... The writer of Hebrews said he needed to reground these believers because they, they had drifted away. The doctrine of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, plural, the doctrine of laying on of hands, the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, and the doctrine of eternal judgment. These are the doctrines of Christ, the fundamental doctrines that all believers need to know about. And one of the foundational doctrines is the doctrine of baptisms, plural. There's more than one baptism in the Bible. There's a doctrine of laying on of hands. There's an entire teaching about that. It's not just something we observe in the gospel. It is to be practiced. So what I'm proposing to you, if we can look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8, which I don't know if we have time, nine minutes left. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Who is he saying that to? The promise of the Father. He was saying it to his apostles, his disciples, those who believed in him, those who had forsaken all and were following him. And he told them, tarry in Jerusalem until what? Until you are clothed with power from on high. That's not talking about salvation. He says, you will receive power, dunamis is the Greek word, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost part of the earth. So if you take the time to look at the scriptures that I'm citing to you, that I'm highlighting to you, you'll find out that Jesus said that there is an encounter with the Holy Spirit. He tells his followers, his disciples, his apostles, don't leave Jerusalem, until you have this experience with the Holy Spirit, until you're clothed with power from on high, and you will receive power, and it's for being witnesses. This is a secondary experience. This is not salvation. This is an encounter with the Holy Spirit. The disciples and apostles were following Jesus, and Jesus puts in front of them an encounter with the Holy Spirit that they must have in order to fulfill the Great Commission. And so, in that, we see that it's given so that they can have power. What's not mentioned in, in the baptism of the Spirit is nothing about forgiveness, nothing about salvation. It's all about empowerment. It's all about witnessing and fulfilling the call of God on their life. And so there's a pattern that you'll see in the Bible. There is conversion, there is initiation, and there is spirit baptism. Men are born again. They receive Christ. They're initiated into the faith by water baptism. 
But then there's something else, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you can see this, which I want to show you in a couple other places, that it always follows people that are believing. It's a separate experience. It's not salvation. Salvation is salvation. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and it is for empowerment. And it opens the doors to having the spiritual gifts operate in your life. In Acts chapter 2, we're told that on the day of Pentecost, certain phenomena happened. And it says, all 120 were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now, does that sound like a salvation experience to you? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. No, this is not salvation. This is something else is going on. And then Peter gets up and says, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. But I'll get back to that later. So this is not a salvation experience. It's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, I'm going to try to read this quickly. So you can see a progression. So you can see that pattern that I told you about. And realizing... It is going to be very hard to condense this much material in two 15-minute presentations with rebuttals. That was where my stress was. How will I get to all these scriptures? So we see here in verse 4 that they were scattered abroad, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. He was not an apostle. As far as I know, I don't know if the apostles laid hands on him at, at that point or not, but he's not an apostle, but he's doing miracles. And the people gave heed with one accord to the things which he spoke because of the miracles. Unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and them that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. So then Simon comes and tries to purchase the gift, and he gets rebuked. I want to drop down to... Um, verse 14 where it says now when the apostles were at Jerusalem they heard that Samaria had received the word of God they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost for as yet he was fallen on none of them only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus now listen, Jesus said, believe, if you believe and you're baptized, you shall be saved. These people received the word, they received the gospel, they were water baptized. These are saved people, and it says, but the Holy Ghost had not fallen on them. Had not fallen on them. Why? Because we're talking about an experience that's not about salvation. These are saved people. And how is the Holy Spirit brought to them by the laying on of hands, one of the foundational doctrines? So right here you see a pattern. They are converted. They are initiated by water baptism, and the apostles come and lay hands on them. And when they do, when they do that, the Holy Ghost comes upon them. And it's so notable that Simon the sorcerer says he could see that through the apostles laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit was given unto them, and he wants that same power. So this is something completely different. Now, if we go to uh, Acts chapter 10, we have uh, Peter preaching to an Italian, a, a Gentile, Cornelius, and to his house. And in verse 44, after he's about, I guess, 30 seconds into his sermon, it says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word, for they heard them speak with tongues and prophesy. So what you have here is, again, the Holy Spirit falling during preaching, interrupting Peter's message of preaching, and they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. And later in chapter 11, Peter says that God had given these Gentiles the Holy Spirit just like he did to us. Just like he did. It was the same thing. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. This was not salvation. And the evidence, and they knew that they had received the Holy Spirit, is because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So we go later to chapter 19, and Paul stumbles upon some disciples, it says, and he goes up to them, and he says, in true Pentecostal fashion, he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we have not even so much heard there is a Holy Spirit. Well, unto what baptism were you baptized? The baptism of John. So then he begins to instruct them. They were already baptized in water once, and now they get baptized in water again in Jesus' name. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Then what does it say? Paul lays hands on them, and the Holy Ghost comes down, and they speak in tongues and prophesy. Like I said, the New Testament, 
the New Testament scriptures, this is a Pentecostal handbook written by tongue talking, devil casting out, prophesying, laying on of hands believers for the same kind. There's no other kind of Christian in the New Testament scriptures. It's all the same. And where the apostles went, they preached the gospel, they baptized people in water, and they would lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit later. Okay, that's how it went. And so if you can see and understand that there is still for believers an experience with God known as the baptism with the Holy Spirit, you're more than halfway there. And there's no way I can prove to you that the gifts continue unless you understand that there's more of God. There's more to experience with God. So let me continue. In Acts chapter 2, Peter says this in verse 38. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God's goal, as glorious as salvation is, as glorious as the new birth is, was to go beyond that. You see in, in the book of Acts a focus of getting people to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, to be full of God. And then he says this in verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you called of God? Does Romans 8 say we are the called of God? This promise of the Holy Ghost is to all that are the called of God. It is for everyone. It isn't just for the apostles. It isn't just for some in the first century. This promise is for everyone far and wide. And what you will see in the New Testament is everywhere they go, and, and maybe later I'll be able to demonstrate all the places where miraculous, charismatic things are mentioned in the various cities and in the churches. And there are people who are ministering in the power of the Spirit that were not apostles. Some of them aren't even named. They're just mentioned in passing by Paul that they were moving in the power of God. So, with 36 seconds left, Spirit baptism, let me try. In John chapter 4, uh, a woman from Samaria talks to Jesus, a woman at the well, and uh, he asks her for water, and he says to her, had you um, known who was asking you, you would have asked me for water, and I would have given you. You know, the gift of, of, of the water of life springing up into everlasting life. And so Jesus would have given this woman everlasting life. But in John chapter 7, he says, If any man thirst, come unto me and drink. And as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But it says, this Jesus spake of the Holy Spirit, who is not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Two experiences are mentioned there. Jesus offers eternal life, the well in her belly that she could have had. He said, I would have gave it to you. And yet in John 7, we're told that the rivers of living water could not be given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He's talking about the day of Pentecost. In John, we're shown both experiences. Sorry, I went over. It's going to be hard not to do. Okay. We're, we're going to have a seven-minute cross-examination. We're going to start with J.D. Ante, I just wanted to ask some uh, questions in regard to clarification. I wanted to clarify some things. So we understand each other, and I understand your position, because I don't want to argue in a straw man sort of way against what you believe. I um, wanted to ask you some qualifying questions. Um, I, I copied this from a, a charismatic church. Let me, let me ask you about it. Would you say that you believe today in the ongoing gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth? Yes. Okay. And like unequivocally, just yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, secondly, and again, this is for my clarification, not a trick question or anything. Do you believe that the canon of Scripture is closed? Yes. Okay. Do you believe in apostles today? Yes. Okay. Do you believe in uppercase A apostles today as in someone of the same type of apostolic stripe as as the authors of the New Testament, Paul, Peter, John, the 12 disciples, and the Apostle Paul? No, I believe they're unique. They're, they were unique? Yes. Okay. Their names are going to be written in the pearly gates. The 12 names of the apostles are there. They're clearly unique. Okay. Here's, here's my question to you, Ante. Um, why do you believe that the canon is closed? Well, if you read the end of Revelation... It clearly indicates that adding to that book, and since it's the last book that was written, would hint to us that the canon is closed. Okay. Just simply. 
Okay, very good. And you believe that continuing prophecy still happens? Yes. Okay, and where does prophecy come from? The Holy Spirit. Okay, and when John wrote those words uh, in the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John the disciple, uh, who gave him those words? The Holy Spirit. Okay, when you prophesy, who gives you those words? If it's from the Holy Spirit, it would be the Holy Spirit. Okay, so why shouldn't I add that to the canon if you're both prophesying of the same Holy Spirit? Well, the New Testament clearly teaches that the gift of prophecy is inferior to the Scripture. Um, Peter, in his epistle, made it clear that we didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we declare to you the power and majesty of the Lord but were eyewitnesses when we heard the voice when they were with him on the mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. And they said, we're not following cunningly devised fables, but then he steers them to a more sure word of prophecy, the Scripture. So the apostles didn't even exalt their oral okay. testimony to the level of Scripture. We're also told that prophecies are to be judged, they're to be weighed, we're to test all things, hold to that which is good. So clearly by telling us that prophecies or words are to be judged and weighed, they cannot possibly be given infallibly or viewed as infallibly there to be tested. Let me, let me ask a question that's a little bit irrelevant to what I just asked. Are you King James only? I heard that you were. Uh, well, it depends only on that ish? definition. Can I add an ish? Ish. I, okay. I am ish. All right. I just, just, uh, a Pentecostal King James only ish. I'm, I'm, chasing, I'm, I'm, chasing a, I'm chasing a rabbit there. You just made the comment that the gifts of prophecy are inferior to Scripture. Yes. But 17 different places in the Bible, the words prophets is used as a synonym for scripture. Mm -hmm. And so how do you reconcile the fact that the law and prophets is used as a synonym for the Old Testament canon of scripture uh, with your belief that prophecy was infallible to scripture and also combined with the fact that what we have in the New Testament is prophecy that has been canonized. So how is scripture inferior to well, itself? There's a difference between a prophet and someone giving a prophetic word. The New Testament clearly teaches any believer can hear God and give a prophetic word, and it's to be tested. Uh, when you're talking about the law and the prophets, you're talking about people that were guided by the Lord, like Moses, people that apparently had an infallible ability to either speak or write or declare things that God had said for future generations. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking actually about offices when the scripture or speaks, people. When the scripture speaks of testing the prophets, which you've referenced twice now in this CX back and forth, um, I ask if you're King James because the King James does not say test the prophecy, but it says let them judge. And so I don't know if you're familiar with the Greek or not, but the rendering would seem to indicate that they're not testing the prophecy. They're testing whether or not the prophets are true. So that being the case, would you uphold that someone could be a prophet of God and yet prophesy fallibly? No, I, I would reject what you said because he references let two or three speak and let the other judge. The emphasis on what is spoken and what is to be judged is what was spoken. Okay, so can you, can you answer the follow-up to that question? which was, if, if the New Testament is prophetic and what John is giving is prophecy, how can Scripture be inferior to itself? It's not inferior. It just doesn't present the gift of prophecy in the New Testament dispensation at a level of Scripture. It presents it as potentially fallible. He said, you all may prophesy so that all may learn, so that all may be comforted. Okay. Clearly, there's a learning curve. Okay. There's a learning Peter, of hearing Peter God. Said, there's no a prophecy learning. has come from man, but prophets prophesy they're carried along by the Holy Spirit, correct? And so if prophecy can be fallible, then how can I know what here in this book, in the Pentecostal handbook, how can I know that that is true? You're, you're equating the prophecy of the Old Testament Scripture with what the New Testament presents to us as a manifestation of the Spirit through fallible people that are learning how to move in the gifts of the Spirit. They're not the same thing. I'm saying that not, not just the Old Testament, Ante, the New Testament itself is prophetic in the New Testament dispensation. So if you're assuming a division between um, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy, I'm willing to concede that for the sake of argument. I'm saying New Testament prophecy, if it is given to us by God and it is fallible, how do I know what is in my New Testament, being that it is prophetic 
given to us, we would say, through the Holy Spirit, through inspired uh, God giving it uh, inspiration through men. How do I know what is in my New Testament is not fallible, like the type of fallible prophecy that those of you in the charismatic movement are typically used to? I, I think you could probably answer that question. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, therefore it's at the highest level. Okay. But when and we look at if it's prophetic, why isn't it then scripture? If because, it's come from God. Because it's not given by that kind of inspiration. I mean, if if prophetic words are to be judged and evaluated, then by very definition, it's indicated that people can be mistaken. They could be uttering their mind and and, and they think it's the Lord and, and it's not the Lord, and it requires Judgment, it requires patience with people, it requires pastoral oversight to help people work through if they make mistakes. But also there are people that have a bad spirit that come into fellowships and there are false prophets. And it won't be just the things they may say at that moment. Sooner or later you're going to find out about their life and their doctrine that something is really amiss. Well, I'm going to have a little bit of a hard time with um, this only because you said so many things. I, don't, I almost don't know where to begin. I, I believe you made so many claims that, that, that are wrong that I don't know where to begin. Um, I would ask you, would you read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 through 30? Verses what? 27 through 30. Sure. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a more excellent way. Okay, so he prefaces, prefaces that by saying, you are the body of Christ, members in particular, and God has set this list mm -hmm. in the church, mm -hmm. and then that list is given. Mm -hmm. Where the church is, that list should follow. Where the body is, that list should follow. How, how do you read that and then decide which ones of those you say, well, that's not for today, that's passed away, that's not today, it's conflated and joined to the church and the body of Christ. Do you not see that? That he's saying that you're the body, you're the church, God has set these ministers and ministries in the I church. I would answer that question through the same type of hermeneutic which you use to deduce that the apostles of the New Testament were somehow unique, uh, and different than the apostles today, even though there's no explicit verse whatsoever that tells you that the apostles were somehow unique and that that type of gifting of the church uh, to the church, the apostles, has changed. You've come to that conclusion through deduction. In the same way that you've used deduction to believe that the canon is closed, even though there's no explicit verse that speaks of the canon or of its closing. And so I would say in the same way that you see that certainly apostolic leadership in some capacity has changed, I wouldn't expect to see those gifts, which we know throughout the rest of Scripture, are tied intrinsically to the apostles. No, I wouldn't expect them to see them in a church without apostles. So you're saying that even though that scripture says that God has set these offices and these ministries in the church and in his body, that you are free to remove some out and say, no, they're not part of the church, they're not part of the body. I'm saying that you have done that with apostles. And in Ephesians chapter 2 and in Ephesians chapter 4, the apostles are mentioned with the prophets that they are paired together twice by the same author, that is Paul, explaining that the prophets and the apostles uh, are tied together intrinsically. Without apostles in the church, in the same way that you don't believe that they're there, at least in the same way, capital A apostle, I would say those gifts have ceased with the apostolate. Then I would point out that as Paul mentions a similar list to the, to the church in Rome later, he omits this to the church of Rome. Didn't the church of Rome have these things? Paul didn't mention them. Paul didn't mention what? Paul didn't mention uh, these uh, giftings to the church as he lists those to, to the book of, uh, in the book of Romans. He mentioned the gift of prophecy in, in chapter 12. Yeah. Here, here. So he did. Okay. I'll have and to. And he encourages them to prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Okay. Here's the thing. As we look at the New Testament scripture, 
we see that the apostolic sign gifts are tied intrinsically to the apostles, to their prophesying and laying hands on those who then go ahead and prophesy. It's simple deduction that if they're not present in the church and they've ceased, as you yourself agree, that we wouldn't see signs designating who is and who is not a true apostle. Are you familiar with Matthew 19.28? You can refresh my memory. Where he references, those of you that have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne, you too shall sit on 12 thrones with me, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Who did he say that to? Uh, well, here's the thing. I, I think it would depend on our eschatological framework, and I don't want to start an eschatology fight, but the fact is there are more than technically 12 patriarchs and there are more than 12 apostles, so it's probably figurative language. Um, Correct. Here, here's, here's the thing, though. There is no explicit verse that says that there would not be further apostles gifted in the same way to authoritatively hand down God's word. That's simply not in the text. And so, again, by deduction, no apostles, which you yourself don't agree with, then uh, at least in a New Testament sort of way, you yourself are a cessationist. I'm just asking you to be consistent. I believe I am. Let's uh, go to uh, Ephesians 4 then. Starting with verse 11 through 13, would you read that? Sure. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness in Christ. Okay, do you believe that We've achieved that state that he describes there, yes. that last verse? Yes, you absolutely. Do? Yes. Even with thousands of divisions and denominations all over the world, you believe we've achieved the unity and the full stature, and the church in the world is expressing the unified wisdom of Jesus? Yeah, I, I think that when you see polemical argumentation, we're not dividing the body of Christ, we're defining the body of Christ. I believe that the body of Christ is unified in essential Christian doctrines, but the important word here, and I may, I may discuss this later, is mature manhood. Uh, if I'm correct, it's the same word used for perfection elsewhere. And so as the church has come to maturity in the canon, we no longer need piecemeal revelations through prophets because we have it given to us in the scripture. And as Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 2 point out, the foundation of the church having been laid in the apostles and the prophets as the canon has been closed, the church has reached maturity in historic redemptive history. So, so those five gifts then are passed away because the goal has been attained. It's not just apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are all gone because right. the goal has been reached. So we have, we'll have 12 minutes for rebuttal, starting with Jordan. <laughs> Well, with terms defined and positions laid out in the most general sense in my first constructive argument, I'll now defend those assertions with more scripture than I did at first. Assertion number one is that the miraculous gifts given to the apostles and by the laying on of hands of the apostles was meant as a sign, signifying the authority of the apostles and not merely reaffirming simply the validity of the message, but more particularly validating the messenger of the prophecy, whether it was the apostle or the prophet, both of whom formed the foundation of the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. As is often argued, miraculous signs and wonders do not occupy every page of redemptive history of the sacred scriptures, and more or less, they're prevalent in only three different dispensations of time. These three periods include the era of Mo Moses and Joshua, the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, the time of Christ, and the apostles. In other words, only while God was giving the law, the prophets, and the gospel do we see signs offered, and those signs were offered to demonstrate the validity of the law givers, the prophets, and Christ, and then his apostles. When Moses was first told that he would demonstrate miraculous signs. It was in a direct answer to a direct question from Moses when he said, what sign could he perform so that they would listen to him? And God responds in Exodus chapter 4 verse 5 and says, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Uh, in 
uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16, as uh, Elijah calls down fire from heaven, uh, he says that it is so that it can be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I've done all of these things at your word. The same thing is said the, the chapter previously in verse 24. Uh, as Elijah performed the miracle for the widow, she said, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your, is, excuse me, the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Clearly in the Old Testament, miraculous signs, even though they might have been acts of compassion or edification, were for the primary purpose of demonstrating the authority of the messenger. We see the same thing in the New Testament as well. Remember, Nicodemus is telling Jesus, we know you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one could do the signs, he says, that you do, unless they've come from God. When the disciples of John the Baptist went and asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, in Luke chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus simply pointed to the signs he performed. That was enough. Also, in each of these cases, the sign not only points to the validity of the messenger, but in particular to the word given by God through them. Signs verify God's authoritative word. The New Testament continues to bear witness of the universality of the point of sign gifts. The author of Hebrews says, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, and he was uh, speaking of those who delivered that word, that is the apostles in verse 2 of that chapter of Hebrews. When Paul defends his apostleship to the Galatians who had come under the sway of the Judaizers and the false super apostles, he says in defense of his ministry that they received, or rather that he received the spirit by works of miracles which he demonstrated. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 through 5. In Acts chapter 4 verse 29, the church prays that the apostles might be proven correct and their word might be accepted as the word of God through miracles, signs, and wonders. Today, charismatics speak of miraculous signs and wonders as being God's sign of his love for you or signs of God's power or signs of God's provision. But in the scripture, signs were demonstrated for the purpose of delivering God's word, whether it was Moses or Elijah or Jesus or the apostles. So then again, if there are no capital A apostles today, and as best I understand my opponent, he doesn't believe there is, at least in the same unique sense, so in some capacity he is a cessationist, for no one fits the biblical test of apostleship, there's no one prophesying today because the prophets only received that ability through the laying on of hands by the apostles. Therefore, God's word is not being continually revealed, and unless, there's no revela unless there is revelation, there's no signs necessary to point to a revelation that is simply isn't coming. Let me demonstrate that for you in the scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 says that each one of us, that is charis, has been given, and then it mentions the doria, the gifts that have been given by the charisma or the charis. Uh, of God. Uh, in verse 11, it mentions apostles and prophets as gifts to the church. Again, this means that, in a sense, my opponent is a cessationist, although an inconsistent one. The Westminster Confession of Faith, in Article 1, Paragraph 6, says, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by revelation of the Spirit or by the traditions of men. Scriptural deduction is the hermeneutic that my opponent uses to affirm the Holy Trinity. It is the hermeneutic he uses to affirm the end of the apostleship, uh, at least in its unique capacity, even though no one verse says so explicitly. Scriptural deduction is how my opponent affirms the close of the canon, even though no single verse mentions the close of the canon. And so here we see a few facts for our consideration so that we can deduce this from the scripture that the apostolic sign gifts have ceased. Consider these things. Number one, signs and wonders were given as a sign of the validity of the apostolic or prophetic messenger. Number two, prophets were mentioned twice by Paul, uniquely being categorized with the apostles in both Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4 in a way unlike evangelists, teachers, and pastors. And the narrative of scripture demonstrates that it was by the laying on of hands by which such prophecy was conferred. Three, God's word is complete and so no more prophecy is needed. Furthermore, because no prophets exist, 
Uh, there is no apostle, by the way, to give them that gift. Therefore, there's no possibility for future revelation. You simply cannot believe in the sufficiency of Scripture if you believe that you need more prophecy to help fill in the gaps. Now, in order to circumvent this logic, logic, by the way, a common grace given to us by God to understand uh, God and his scripture, those believing in prophecy must not only concede that prophets can exist without apostles, which is scripturally untenable, they must also lower the standard in the scriptural bar for what constitutes prophecy, and you heard my opponent do that. It's here that I boldly proclaim that assertions of continued prophecy undermine the scripture, attack sola scriptura, and disgrace the sufficiency of scripture. A few things here. First of all, prophecy Prophecy is always, in principle, canonical, an expression I've borrowed from Brother Sam Waldron. It is always, in principle, canonical. While there were certainly prophecies given which were not preserved by divine providence to find their way into the canon, they were by principle canonical. In other words, we have no prophecies that we believe that were given by God's prophets that the church simply chose to leave out of the canon. If we have the prophecy, it is considered God's word. Now, oddly enough, one of the reasons why I'm a cessationist is because I read Grudem's Systematic theology, even though he's a continuationist, because here's what, he's taught. here's what he taught. He taught that all of uh, God's words, and no matter how God speaks, is equally authoritative, whether he writes uh, in tablets of stone with his fingers, uh, through a burning bush, uh, through his prophets, or out loud, no matter what, however God speaks, it's authoritative. As a matter of fact, as I pointed out in the cross-examination 17 times in the Old Testament, prophets is used as a euphemism, as a synonym for scripture. The prophets speaking the words of God were by nature canonical. The rules guiding and characterizing to true prophecy were given in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and they were never revoked. They require 100% accuracy in both the revelation that was given and the delivery of the prophecy, or else stoning was the consequence, and the people of God were to determine them false. Do you know why charismatics don't believe in a prophecy that has to be infallible? It's because none of them would be alive today if we continued to follow that Old Testament law. The counterfeit prophecies today done by those in the charismatic movement famously were said by Bob Jones, the charismatic leader, to be about 10% accurate. Michael Bickle, another leader in the movement, estimates that some of the better prophets might be up to 80%. This is why extreme charismatics and continuationists like Michael Brown to the less extreme like Wayne Grudem and John Piper all have to redefine what constitutes prophecy, claiming that New Testament prophecy is from God, sure enough, but it might be fallible because people are fallible. And yet, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, if the person relayed the prophecy infallibly or rather fallibly with error in it, they were, were, they were to be put to death. I would ask the question, is the spirit delivering prophecy in the Old Testament different from the Spirit delivering prophecy in the New Testament, and of course we have to say no, not at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes they even attack the prophet Agabus in Acts chapter 21, claiming that uh, his prophecy was not true. Therefore, attacking the inerrancy of the word of God and bearing false witness against one of God's prophets, serving to undermine scripture itself. Now, the real question for us is, how is it even possible for someone to claim that New Testament prophecy is fallible and yet hold to the New Testament canon at all when it was given to us by New Testament prophets? Other attempts at making New Testament prophecy fallible or less inspired than Old Testament prophecy are equally as caustic to the scriptures and no less nefarious. Some have suggested that New Testament prophecy was understandably fallible because Paul instructs the church in 1 Corinthians 14.29 to let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. The translation here of the Greek, as the King James says, is let others judge, which is precisely what the King James says and the Young's literal translation and other, word, and, and other translations. The Greek says let them discern. They were not to judge the content of the prophet's message as though a true prophet could somehow give false prophecy. No, they were judging the prophet, not the prophecy. Prophecy not yet in the canon of scripture could not be tested by scripture because by its very nature, it's outside of the Bible. New, uh, new prophets today simply say, well, just judge our prophecies by scripture. I can't because it's not in scripture. There's no possible way to test it according to scripture because it's simply not there. Not only must continuationists impugn New Testament prophecy with fallibility and errors in order to continue propagating the myth that prophecy continues to exist, they must stretch and skew the meaning and the prescribed use of tongues in order to propagate the vain babbling that often happens in ecstatic utterance. And I'm going to get to that in the next presentation. I don't want to get ahead of myself. What modern day charismaticism represents is prophecy that is not that prophetic. Tongues that are stuttering syllables of guttural groanings of uselessness, 
and miracles of healings that are no more powerful than a parlor trick or a healthy dose of placebo. False signs and false wonders designed to amuse false Christians and to distract them from the truth of God's word and the real miracles of the spirit, which include regeneration, faith, and repentance as gifted to the believer by God's sovereign grace. Now, my opponent happened to agree with a statement from a charismatic church in regards to their statement, uh, their statement of faith in terms of tongues and prophecy. I'd like to point out the website that I pulled that from was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You see, what happens is when we believe that all prophecy can continue today, there's really no good way of testing that against Scripture so long as the prophet says this is how you are to properly interpret Scripture. This is the sin of the Roman Catholic Church and their continued revelation and the infallibility of the Pope. But we as Protestants must say we stand on sola scriptura and we stand upon the sufficiency of scripture. Well, the kind of objections that my brother is making has been answered in many books in great detail and it's impossible in the, in the short time frame that I have is just to look at a few. But this is nothing new, and, and the bombast and the attacks and uh, claiming that possibly we're of the devil, I mean, I don't know where else you could go except to deduce by what he's saying that, that um, all these people are speaking by another spirit, and it's not the Holy Spirit, or they're not of God altogether. You know, he mentions that he got that from a Mormon website. Well, that's great logic. Mormons believe in prayer. I guess we can't pray then because, after all, Mormons believe in prayer. They'll even pray to the Father in Jesus' name. So now that suspect, according to his line of argument and logic. And so I want to point out to you that he uses a bunch of unbiblical terms and uh, tries to foist terms and concepts together that are not there. Apostolic sign gifts. Not so. Tongues and prophecy are not apostolic sign gifts. They're given, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 4, to every believer to profit everyone. In chapter 14, we're told that prophecy speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to people. That's its purpose, to edify, exhort, and comfort people. It's not to attest some, someone's authority or office. It's actually to bless God's people. And the word that Paul uses is to profit everyone. When people speak prophetically, in a service, if it's of God, it should bless everyone. That is the point, not demonstrate someone's authority or attest to some apostolic, whatever he's saying, apostolic signs, wonders, uh, attestation. The New Testament doesn't teach this. He's using terms and melding concepts together that aren't there. Now, I am going to go to Mark 16 because I'm not going to let people just start chopping verses out of the Bible simply because they don't like what it says. In Mark 16, we have an interesting ending. Now, we're told by some scholars, some people have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They deny the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, from such turn away. That's what the Bible says to do with those who deny the power of God. In Mark chapter 16, we're told, these signs shall follow them that believe. Not apostles. Them that believe. In my name... They will cast out devils. Is that, is that of the devil now, to cast demons out of people? Is that of the devil? People who cast devils out of people, is that demonic now? That went away in the first century. Did all the demons go away too? They'll cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now we're told here, we're, we have a description of what the believing community would look like. And these are the words of the Lord Jesus. And he said, these signs would follow believers, not apostles, believers. So now you have to read your Bible and then tell me that you see these are apostolic sign gifts that are unique to the apostles. If you're going to keep reading that into the Bible, or if you're actually going to accept what it says, these signs will follow them that believe. That's what it says. I accept it. He rejects that. As a matter of fact, he'll probably cite some kind of uh, statistics that say that that ending's not really a part of Mark. I can refute that later. I don't believe Mark's gospel ended at verse 8 with, for they were afraid, with no resurrection account, with no ascension account. It just ended with 
that the apostles were afraid. And the people that came up with this theory were infidels who believed Mark's gospel was first. And it, they didn't initially believe in the resurrection. It was made up later. It was the earliest gospel. That's why he ends at verse 8. And then later when the apostles concocted this theory of the resurrection, you find this added ending. And you find these resurrection accounts in the other gospels which were written later. That's the origin of taking away the ending in Mark's gospel is because infidels said that initially they didn't believe in the resurrection. There was no resurrection account. The apostles made it up later. That's the source of rejecting the ending of Mark. It's from the devil. So, so many things to, to speak on. Romans 14, 17, I'll throw some verses out to you. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In 1 Corinthians 4, 20, Paul said, For the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. It's in dunamis. Paul said, My preaching and my teaching was not was not with the uh, wisdom of men, the enticing words of men, but it was in demonstration of the spirit and of power of dunamis, the thing that Jesus promised, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom and the apologetic and scholarly ability of men, but that your faith would rather rest in the power of God. That was Paul's philosophy of ministry. He did not use enticing words of man's wisdom. He demonstrated the power of God, and he said he, he did that so that people's faith would rest in the power of God and not in the wisdom of men. Nothing's changed. Men have been following men since Corinth, and they do it now. They're attracted to intellect. They're attracted to argument. They're attracted to all kinds of debate. Paul shunned all of that. He said, I want you to be attracted to God via his power and the demonstration of his power when I preach. That's Bible doctrine. That's Bible 101. Okay, six minutes. So he denies that there are other apostles, even though there are other apostles. He says he believes in some of the gifts, but some of the word gifts don't exist. His list of what gifts continue are very arbitrary. I don't know by what criteria he's using. And out of one side of his mouth, I hear him say that some of these gifts are still for today. And then on the other side, they're not. There are nine gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And I haven't heard which ones are for today and which ones aren't and how he arrived at that other than some nebulous term that he didn't prove that tongues is associated with apostles or something. It is not. It is not. The believers in Corinth were speaking in tongues. As a matter of fact, they were speaking in tongues a little too. Too much but Paul did say that he prayed in tongues more than any man and Paul said in Philippians 4 that which you have heard of and seen and know of in me do he said do like me my my life my salvation is a pattern he said for all hereafter who would believe well Paul prayed in tongues more than any man if you want to be like Paul rather than unlike him you should pray in tongues a lot if you want to be like Paul you should let a simple layman like Ananias in Acts chapter 9 come to you and lay hands on you to heal your eyes and so that you could be filled with the Holy Ghost after you're saved which is what happened to Paul Paul received the baptism of the Holy Spirit by a man named Ananias who was not an apostle who really wasn't anybody but he went and laid hands on Paul, and Paul got filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. That's New Testament. This isn't apostolic sign gifts yoked to them, and these apostles passed away, and it's all over. I mean, the Holy Spirit is coming to the world. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's moving in power, and he's winning people to the Lord, and he's doing what he's always done for 2,000 years, whether men want to believe it or not. Four minutes. I have to decide what I'm going to touch on. He said, you don't judge a prophet's word, you judge the prophet. So a, a man who claims to be a prophet gets up in an assembly and starts speaking, and he says, we don't judge his words, we judge him. What does that mean? What, do I look at the way he's dressed? If I'm not going to judge what he's saying, if I'm not going to discern whether this guy is of God or not by what his word, what's the criteria? He's saying i got to judge the man. By what? His appearance? His outfit? The way he talks, whether he has an accent, this is ridiculous. We're judging what he says, whether it's of God or not. Obviously, we're judging the words. He's saying we're judging the man, not the words. Unbiblical. What's the criteria? I have no idea. This is all arbitrary. He says the Holy Spirit's still continuing his work that he was sent down to do on the day of Pentecost. He's still convicting of sin and encouraging believers. Why is so much instruction given in the New Testament about 
tongues, prophecy, the gifts of the Spirit. Chapters are devoted to this. Something that he thinks was not important was going to pass away. Why is so much teaching devoted to this? Why is so much material in the book of Acts devoted to this? If it was going to go away. I would say that the Lord put a little too much information on that which was transient, temporary, and not important if his view is true. But if his view is not true, it makes perfect sense why we have extensive teaching on the gifts of the Spirit because it's normative. It's part of the church. God has set the following in the church. You, you heard it in 1 Corinthians 12. He has set apostles, prophets, teachers, working of miracles, tongues, prophecy, interpretation, administrations, all these things. That is in the church. Where the church is, those gifts are. Where the body of Christ is, according to Paul, that's what you will find. And he can't begin to just pluck them away like a four-leaf clover because it doesn't fit his worldview and paradigm. <sighs> Ephesians 4. False interpretation. He says this is fulfilled. I find this completely ridiculous. Let me read it. Jesus Christ gave gifts, Doria, not the charismata that he talks about, not the pneumatica, the spiritual gifts that he talks about. This is another word he uses. And there's five of them, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They're gifts from Jesus to his people. He sounds like he despises these gifts that, that express the, the fivefold wisdom of God to his church. And they're given by Jesus to build us up, he says here, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Is the work of the ministry still continuing in the world? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Is that done? Is the, is the body of Christ edified in the first century and we don't need edifying now? He's saying this is all fulfilled. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's saying that's fulfilled. Well, the problem with that is that assertion is absurd. But the other problem is, as Paul says here, these five gifts were given to achieve this result. If he says that the uh, result is achieved, then the five gifts are gone. So not only did he just get rid of apostles and prophets, he just got rid of evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You can't have it both ways. This is not exegesis. This isn't following sound rules of hermeneutics. This is just trying to find a way to escape the plain teaching and truths that are assumed throughout the entire New Testament. There are Pentecostal people. The Holy Spirit has been sent down. There is more of God. There is more of his power. There is more of the walk in the Spirit. There are things that God wants to accomplish in you and through you beyond just saving you. Okay, he wants you to know the spirit. He wants you to know his voice. He wants you to be able to hear the voice of God for yourself. My sheep hear my voice. Jesus said that. The Holy Spirit is speaking through, to people throughout the book of Acts. They weren't unique and special. He was speaking to every uh, strata of Christian in the New Testament. And Corinthians is full of just regular Gentile believers. And if you read chapters 12, 13, and 14, you realize that the gifts were given clearly for them to benefit them. It has nothing to do with apostles. It has to do with us it benefits us and those that would rob that from us they weaken the church they make it uh, not be able to manifest the power of God it's a shame I, I am here to annihilate cessationism to me cessationism is a heretical doctrine it's not the historical doctrine of the church I'll prove later that the gift did not, did not pass away when John died the the early church fathers continued to assert plainly that the gifts continue and they further said that the gifts would cease when Jesus comes back and not before and in my next presentation I'm gonna give a positive presentation showing you that Paul specifically plainly taught that the gifts would continue until Jesus comes back. Plain teaching of the New Testament. All right, we're, we're now going to have the opening that is going to start from the negative uh, with Ante. Um, it is going to, I just need to reset this for you. This is going to be 15 minute opening on both parts. Okay, am I on? Okay, I'm going to try to prove to you that the Bible plainly teaches that the gifts of the Spirit would continue until Jesus came back. And so I want to start with Matthew 28 where Christ says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now that is quite a tremendous statement. In light of that, he says, Go therefore. 
Why? Because all power has been given to him in heaven and earth. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So he makes this dramatic statement that all power is given to him, and in light of all that power, you can go and preach the gospel. Why? Because he's backing us up. Now, the opposing view would indicate that Jesus has all power. He encouraged the beginning apostles to go out into the world, and he'd back them up with this great Pentecostal power, but then he'd suddenly withdraw it and leave 1,900 years of world evangelism to the rest of the church without all this power and all this encouragement. I find that to be ridiculous. And so, again, in Luke 24, he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And then in Acts 1, he says, you'll receive power to be witnesses unto me to the ends of the earth. He ties the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I mentioned to you, to accomplishing the task of global evangelism, which still has not been accomplished. May I add, therefore the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are necessary to finish the work that was commissioned to the one church, the one body. There aren't two. There aren't two church ages, the first century and then the next 1900 years. You don't find two church ages in the Bible. You find one church, one church age, from the time Jesus came and left until the time he comes back. And so in Mark 16, I believe, which I read to you, it interprets this uh, um, great commission where he says, these signs will follow them that believe. They'll be casting out devils. They'll speak in tongues. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll even take up serpents like Paul did. He was bitten, and he shook that serpent off. And if they drink, not on purpose, but if you do, God promises protection, and we're told that God confirmed the word. He confirmed the word as they went forth preaching everywhere. That's what God promised to do, and he promised to do, that, do it until the end of the age. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And so in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, Peter gets up in verse 16, he starts to preach, and he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. They all get baptized in the Holy Ghost, there's phenomena going on, people overhear these men speaking in tongues and languages, and they're marveling at it all, and, and Peter gets up and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, according to the New Testament, we're in the last days. We're still in the last days. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That means people from every nation, not just Jews. That's what it means, all flesh. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all, all people. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Sounds to me like God likes prophesying visions, dreams. It doesn't seem like he has a problem with that. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. That great and notable day of the Lord where this celestial phenomenon takes place has not come, but it's coming. And the indication here from Peter is this is what God's going to be doing. We are now in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. He is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh, and they're prophesying, they're seeing, and they're hearing God for themselves. It's not reserved anymore to a select few like it was under the Old Covenant. Now everyone can receive the Holy Spirit. Everyone can hear from God. Everyone can speak for God. Praise the Lord. And then he says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is the New Testament dispensation. Okay, that's the plan of salvation. Tied in with that is the outpouring of the Spirit. And we're told that's going to continue on these, until these celestial phenomena take place, until that great and notable day of the Lord comes. And there is no way that anyone's going to convince me that day has already come. It has not. So 1 Corinthians, no, excuse me, yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 Chapter 1, I'm talking too fast. Paul says this to the Corinthians. He greets them and says, I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, confirming the word, end of Mark, end of Luke, so that you come behind in no gift, 
No charismatic gift. You've come behind in no gift. Doing what? Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is praising God that they're filled with the gifts of the Spirit, all utterance, all knowledge, all the things that the gifts of the Spirit bring. He's praising God for that grace, what he's done. And he says they've come behind in no gift, no charisma, waiting for the coming of the Lord. What do we deduce from that? That these gifts will continue as we wait for the coming of the Lord. There's no interim age. Well, the gifts are going to pass away after about 100 years, and then for 1,900 years, they're just not going to be around. There is no such teaching in the New Testament. That is a man-made doctrine, and it's a doctrine that's crippled the church and weakened the church and weakens its ability to fulfill the Great Commission and bless God's people. And he says, Who shall also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? And so what you have here is Paul plainly linking the gifts of the Spirit right up until the day Jesus comes back. There is no interim age where this goes away. The charisma, the charismata continues. It's going to operate in God's people as we're looking for and waiting for the return of the Lord. That's just simple believing what it says here. We turn to chapter 12, which we touched on earlier. I just want to show you again. In verse 27, listen to what Paul said, not what men say. Paul said, you are the body of Christ. Does the body of Christ exist today? Or did it pass away? You are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set, God has set some in the church. Is the church still here? Or did that pass away? So the body of Christ and the church, and God has set this in his body, in his church. He has set them in there. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. I don't know how you throw out the first two, but then decide arbitrarily, but we like the teaching part. We'll keep that. Um, after that, miracles. He has set this in the body, in the church. Miracles. Uh, then, gifts of healings. Nothing about apostolic. He just set it in the church with the body of Christ, with the members. This is what you find. This is New Testament church. Helps. Has helps passed away? Governments. Has governments in the church passed away? Diversities of tongues. God has set this in the body, in the church. And then he says not all people can do all these things. He apportions to different members. But where the church is, where the body is, this is to exist. God has set this in the body. God has set these ministries in the church. Chapter 13 a passage that is used by cessationists sometimes to claim that the gifts passed away with the coming of um, the New Testament canon or the death of the last apostle or whatever they have to say to make you think it's all gone away. None of that's in 1 Corinthians 13. We're told love never fails, but prophecies, they will fail, they'll cease. Tongues, they shall cease. Knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the perfect is supposed to be the New Testament canon, the completion of the New Testament. Uh, but Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known. So he's talking about a perfect knowledge. In chapter 8, he says, now that you know God, or rather are known by God, this is what he says, we're now known by God. He says, when the perfect comes, then we'll know as we are known. We will have complete full knowledge. We don't have that. Anyone who walks around claiming they have complete and full knowledge and understanding of everything pertaining to the mysteries of God is delusional. This is talking about a complete knowledge. Further, in 1 John 3, 2, it says, I better read it because I'm talking so fast I'm getting tongue-tied. Just to let Scripture interpret Scripture, in chapter 3, he talks about, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear. It does not yet appear. We don't see it. What we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's when we'll have the complete knowledge. That's when we'll see face to face. That's what Paul meant. And as a side note, maybe I'll bring it up later, not only did the early church fathers after the apostles 
possibly two dozen of them claim and say that the gifts of the Spirit were still manifesting in the churches, unlike what he said. But I will also let you know that, that these same fathers used this passage to teach explicitly that this taught that the gifts of the Spirit would end when Jesus comes back. They appealed to this not to teach that the gifts ended in the first century or with the New Testament ca canon. They all taught exactly what I'm telling you. This is going to continue until Jesus comes back. And maybe I'll have time to tell you why they taught that because they were dealing with heretics who began twisting uh, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says this, He had just mentioned in great deal the return of the Lord and our being caught up unto him, and we will ever be with the Lord, and then the times and the seasons and sudden destruction will come upon them. They will not escape. We're not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. He mentions we're children of light, not of darkness, that that day will overtake us as a thief, put on the breastplate of salvation. All these encouragements, but the context is the end times, the coming of the Lord, and the sudden destruction is going to come upon a, a world that's asleep, and for us to not be caught there. And he says... He says, know them in verse 12, which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace amongst yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them which are unruly. Boy, do we have a problem with that in America. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient to all men. Are we still supposed to be doing this? Or did that pass away? I'm just curious. Is that passed away, those commands? See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Is that for today? Pray without ceasing. Is that for today? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Now why would anyone despise prophesying? Oh, because people can mess up the prophetic gift. People can say things that are wrong and make trouble and make you not want people prophesying or ministering that gift. But he's telling you, don't despise prophesying. I have heard up here what I can only describe as deliberate disobedience to this. That's what I've heard, a despising of prophesying. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophesying. Prove all things. You have to test it. Obviously, prophecy is not equal to Scripture. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to prove it. Hold fast to that which is good. You have to discern. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. So you see these instructions the prophecy, the quenching not the spirit, everything that Paul mentions, the supernatural, charismatic references, right up until the coming of the Lord. There's no interim age where this ends after 100 years, and for 1,900 years this doesn't apply. The coming of the Lord is all mixed in with the charismatic gifts. You find this all throughout the New Testament. There is no separation. It's arbitrary. It's made by men. It's not true. It's not real. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says this. I mean, it's just a simple statement. But it needs to be said. In verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. Are you being taught that? Because that's in the Bible. You should covet, really desire to prophesy. That's a command. Covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues. End of story as far as I'm concerned. He wants to rescind that, but that's what Paul said. Let all things be done. Stop right there. He says, yes, decently and in order, but let all things be done. What things? What things he's just been talking about for three chapters? The gifts of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit, it's what it's called. Where the Holy Spirit is, He manifests Himself in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is through the gifts of the Spirit in His people. And He says, let them be done. Covet to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Well, there are those that will not obey that.
couple of things here as I get started. First of all, I feel like there's been some repetition and a dog is chasing its tail a little bit. So I'm going to try to move to new material so as to not bore you all to death. I'm also going to uh, avoid the conversation about the latter ending that is disputed in the book of Mark because I'm afraid that this debate would devolve, devolve into a debate on King James onlyism and this is not tag team and James White is not here to help with that. Uh, and also uh, we're going to talk about some, I, I think we're going to go to some new territory, particularly that of tongues as my opponent brought it up. As stated previously, the gift of tongues, which in Greek is glossa, uh, was translated by the Holman Christian Standard Bible as languages in its recent change by the CSB going back to the term uh, tongues instead of languages, they actually stated it was to appease a charismatic consumer base. I'm not really saying anything that you probably don't know or that people don't regularly admit to. The glossa in the Greek simply means languages, and in King James Version parlance, tongues meant just that, actual languages. What you need to understand is when my opponent talks about speaking in tongues, he's not speaking about the gift of xenoglossia, he's not speaking about the gift of heteroglossia, he's speaking about the gift of ecstatic utterance, which in fact is no gift at all. Now, as previously stated, tongues are a form of prophecy. In verse 2, chapter 2 of the book of Acts, those speaking xenoglossia were said to have spoken, quote, as the Spirit gave them utterance, meaning that they were in every sense speaking from the Holy Spirit inspired things, which is the very definition of prophecy. Moreover, Peter explains that the spiritual outpouring at Pentecost, as my opponent pointed out, was a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, he says, this is what was spoken of the prophet Joel writing in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy well here's the thing the only prophecy that was recorded in Acts chapter 2 other than the sermon by Peter which ended up in the scripture the only type of prophecy at all that was demonstrated by both men and women young and old was the gift of tongues tongues is prophecy as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance likewise Paul makes tongues the dynamic equivalent of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14 27 admonishing them on not speaking in tongues over one another and then he calls such prophecy such behavior prophecy or revelation likewise in the context of tongues and prophecy and I think I'll throw this in just as a side note for fun. Women are, are forbidden in that passage to exercise the gift of prophecy or tongues in the congregation, and they're told to remain silent. And it's notable that since the days of Montanus the heretic, women have always led the charismatic movement. Paul began his rebuke of the Corinthian church for their charismatic excesses in chapter 14 by equating prophecy with tongues, saying, now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. And that prophecy is always listed in the scripture as a higher gift than mere teaching. The only way one who can prophesy, not being greater than the one who speaks in tongues, is if the one who is speaking in tongues is prophesying. Again, logical deduction would indicate this is the only possible understanding of the text. In fact, in the very next verse, verse 6, Paul says that it is no benefit to the church at all if someone speaks of tongues in tongues if it's not a teaching that is prophetic or revelatory. Tongues are a sign gift called a sign in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Here, Paul refers to the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28, 42 and also the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 28 for with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people to whom he said this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear we see that tongues was explicitly assigned for unbelieving Jews both in the days of Pentecost and also in Acts 8 when the Gentiles speaking in tongues was the reason why Peter was able to defend their baptism that is the Samaritans and convince the Jews that they were now believers and Peter references the outpouring of tongues upon the Gentiles, again in Acts chapter 15, which was what beat back the Judaizing heresy at the Jerusalem Council. Here in both instances, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 8, we see tongues demonstrated in the historic redemptive narrative for the purpose of convincing Jews of God's redemptive purpose. Likewise, we see tongues as xenoglossia, that is, the speaking of foreign languages, explicitly in Acts chapter 2, as people of 16 different languages heard 120 prophecies 
prophesy in their own tongues. This is one of the few places in Scripture we see tongues actually demonstrated. The next place, as I said, was Acts chapter 8, and that is often called the Pentecost of the Gentiles, when again, we see the speaking of foreign tongues. When Peter talks about this in Acts chapter 15, he says they, excuse me, Acts chapter 9, he says they spoke in tongues just like we did at the beginning, which was foreign languages. In both instances, we see tongues actually demonstrated as opposed to just talked about, and it was actual languages performed for Jews, then a few years later for Samaritans as a sign of the new covenant that God had made with mankind in like of, of, of Old Testament prophecy, Deuteronomy 28 and Isaiah 28. Uh, I would remind my charismatic friends that upon the supposed revival of the gift of tongues, which began after a, a woman by the name of Agnes Osman, under the preaching of Charles Parham, said that she spoke in tongues, the gift upon its first revival was actually xenoglossia, supposedly. She claims to have spoken in Chinese under the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't later until these charismatic, fraudulent claims could be tested that people said this isn't a foreign language, and then and only then did the charismatic movement begin to normalize ecstatic utterance instead of making claims of xenoglossia. It's nothing that we see in scripture, the speaking of gibberish, and it's always been condemned by the church historic. And so therefore, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 has Paul asking the question in relation to uninterpreted tongues. He says, how can this be of any use to the outsider? And get it, and, excuse me, indicating again that tongues were a gift, a sign to the unbeliever, not to believers. The notion of tongues as a private prayer language is not scripturally deduced, but it is, uh, it is externally eisegeted into the text. Interpreting Paul's exhortation in 1 Corinthians 14 as a practice of private prayer language is imposed upon the text not found within it. Often the passage, if not the only passage, used to demonstrate this is Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says, I thank God that I speak in the tongues of uh, more than all of you, he says. Nevertheless, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue or in a language. The imposed implication is that if Paul does not make a habit of speaking in tongues regularly in the church, and yet if he's spoken in tongues more than everyone else, he must do it a lot in private. The problem is that exegetically and expositionally, Paul had already called that practice pointless several times in that chapter. And so therefore, we have to consider the notion to be spurious, dubious, if not detestable. In fact, the notion of speaking in tongues without an interpreter and speaking in tongues without prophecy and speaking in tongues privately, he says to them in the very next verse, verse 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. Paul is equating such speaking in tongues to childishness. It was a rebuke, and he stirred them up to maturity. Now, it's here that the charismatic goes to several go-to passages that are used as a standard defense of their version of ecstatic utterance of non-language, their practice, uh, which is essentially non-tongues gibberish by appealing to 1 Corinthians 13, which also deals with the topic of prophecy, and my opponent quoted it. Love never ends. As for prophecy, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, they will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It's not hard to apply basic biblical exegesis to this text to disarm the babbler and prove his prattling is either demonic or self-induced mystical delusion. His argument will be, or is, in verse 10, when the perfect comes to be a mention of the eschaton, or heaven. That's what it must mean. It must, be, it must mean heaven. This comes from the charismatic interpretation of verse 12, in that the term seen face to face must mean seeing God face to face. Then and only then would prophecy and tongues cease in the eschaton, or perhaps when you personally go to heaven, and only then would tongues and prophecies cease. Now here are the problems with that interpretation. First of all, verse 9 speaks of the partial. The question is, in the context of the passage, what is the partial? 
Well, the partial, very explicitly, is revelation. Revelation is coming to them in a piecemeal format, little by little, through tongues and prophecy. The partial, in verse 9, goes away when the perfect comes. And if the revelation of the church is what was partial, then what would be the full, the perfect, the complete, the mature? And the answer is, in keeping with the way language works and metaphors and, and comparisons in general, the Apostle Paul is saying that the perfect is the Scripture. It's not heaven. It wouldn't make any sense in his comparison. As a matter of fact, this word perfect is the word teleos in Greek, and teleos is translated mature in almost every place that it's used in Scripture. When the church has matured, there will be no need for impartial revelation because we'll have full revelation. Likewise, we see the translation of this word perfect, meaning mature, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Clearly, clearly the word does not imply sinless perfection, neither does it uh, imply the state of glorification or the type of of glorification one would have in heaven, but it speaks of maturity, completeness, being grown up. So when Beth Moore stands up and says, I have a prophecy, I say, sit down, woman, I've got 66 books of the Bible. I don't need that anymore. The church is mature. We simply don't need it. And so the scripture itself, that ek merios, the partial, uh, is replaced, or rather the scripture isn't replaced. The scripture replaces the ek merios in Greek, the partial, Because the fulfillment of it all has come, the completion of the canon. But then the charismatic answers, well, what about the face-to-face part? In my previous debate with Matt Slick, he went on afterward to claim that face-to-face is used as an expression similar to that which was likening Moses' encounter with God. And to that I say, amen and amen. I think it is a reference to Moses' encounter with God, one who saw God face-to-face. Exodus chapter 33 is where we see that. And in that chapter, God is comparing other prophets to Moses. They were vague. They were, they were not clear. They had to be exposited and carefully considered. These prophets had to be tested. But Moses was a prophet that God spoke with face to face. And by the way, when Moses spoke with God face to face, God gave him, drum roll please, the Ten Commandments, the Scripture. And so when we see God face to face, the New Testament canon, the words of God, prophecy in the New Testament that is not fallible but is infallible has been given to us as though we have a prophet that is greater than Moses that is Jesus Christ who has given us his words and we know it's true because we've seen God through our prophet Jesus Christ and have the holy scripture the charismatic has continued problems with his interpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as the passage closes out verse 3 so faith hope and love abide these three but the greatest is love faith however according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 is the evidence It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see a problem with that? There is no faith in heaven because it is there that we see. There is no hope in heaven because it is there that we see. So if the eschaton is face to face when we see God, the question is, why do we need faith in heaven again? We don't. So it's not speaking of the eschaton. It's not speaking of that at all. Faith goes away as soon as we go to heaven. We don't need it anymore. We'll see God personally. Paul continues to work toward the concept of maturity back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 by telling them to be mature rather than acting like children, to give up childish ways. And friends, childish ways could not be a better description of the modern charismatic movement, full of every vain imagination, blatant superstition, and insolent sinful behavior that commonly characterizes the large swath of the movement. You have scripture. The church is matured upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. You've complete revelation. You've no longer any need to receive partial, lesser, piecemeal revelation. Furthermore, we do not see that tongues is a requirement of salvation, as is often taught in the first and second wave of the Pentecostal movement, nor is it proof of the the, uh, salvation of souls. Uh, Acts mentions numerous accounts of those saved without tongues, the 3,000 at Pentecost, the lame who was healed in chapter 3, those converted of the healing of the lame man in chapter 4, those saved after Ananias and Sapphira got struck dead in chapter 5, a bunch of priests in chapter 6, the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, those saved after Dorcas was resurrected in chapter 9, those in Antioch, the Cyprian proconsul, the believers in Pisidia and Antioch and Iconium and Derbe and in Lystra, the Philippian jailer, those in Thessalonica, the Bereans, the Athenians, the Corinthians, all of us, in the, all of them in the book of Acts, explain to us how they came to faith in Jesus Christ without the full gifts of the Spirit, as my opponent would say, that is the gift of tongues, which was given to signify specific things, chiefly a sign of unbelief to the Gentiles. If that is what God wants of all of us to do such things and to speak 
prophecy in this way. The question is, why is the book of Acts replete with story after story after story of no one speaking in tongues except for four different occasions? And I hope to get to that in my rebuttal. Finally, consider these facts. No one in the scripture is commanded to speak in tongues, period. You can't find it. No one in scripture is commanded to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as though it were any kind of secondary act that should be sought for by the believer. Doesn't happen, didn't happen. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is pronounced upon those who did not receive the gift of tongues. The charismatic church has perverted the gift of languages, changed its meaning, and have blasphemed the Holy Spirit by crediting to the Holy Spirit what has come either from demons in some cases or in others the vain imagination and the self-deception of men. Okay, we're going to have a seven-minute cross-examination. We're going to start with... Am I on? Okay, so you're saying that in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul was referring to the completed New Testament canon. That's the perfect that would come and bring the gifts to an yeah, end. Yeah, so that's how comparisons work. So he's talking about the prophecy being partial, ekmerios, and then he, he talks about the teleos, the perfect that comes. And so the perfect would be in comparison to the partial. The full revelation of God has come, yes, and that is speaking of the canon of Holy Scripture. Okay, and then you reference 2 Timothy 3.16, which you said that the inspired Scripture that Paul is telling Timothy about makes a man perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And yeah. you, you believe that interprets that. Would you read verse 15 so we can get clarification? In 2 Timothy 3, what Paul was actually talking about. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to read it. 2 Timothy chapter what? Three, chapter verse, 3, verse 16. Well, that's the one you said interprets 1 Corinthians. Right. I want you to read the verse before. Verse 15. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So these scriptures that made Timothy perfect, Paul says that Timothy had been acquainted with these scriptures since childhood. Mm -hmm. And he was actually taught it by his grandmother and mother. Right. Is he not clearly talking about the Old Testament scriptures here and not the New Testament? Uh, yeah, he, I would say that he is speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, which was sufficient in the same way that the New Testament scriptures uh, are sufficient now that the canon has been complete. That is what God wanted them to have. They needed nothing else. That 400-year period of silence between Malachi and John the Baptist uh, was okay. They had what they needed for the time period in which they lived. Uh, comparably, in the time period in which we now live, we have all the prophecy that we now need uh, because the canon has been made complete. Well, the problem I have is you appeal to this verse as indicating that the completion of the New Testament canon is what made him perfect and hence tied it to 1 Corinthians 13, but Paul is only talking about the Old Testament scriptures, which means then that you're saying that the perfect had come simply through the Old Testament. You can't appeal to this. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, not the New. You're, you're misapplying. Well, I, I can appeal to it, and I first appealed to it because 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that the scripture is sufficient. It is sufficient for us. During the time period of Timothy's life, as he's being raised as a child, uh, he had what he needed. And yet, now that we have the New Testament canon, we need this as well. And that, in its completion, is the perfect, and it is what allows us, enables us, to become mature in Jesus Christ. And if you notice, here in the passage, he makes a reference again to childhood. There is a growing up and a maturing that happens in the faith through the Holy Scripture, which is the point of the passage. Okay. Um where does the Bible plainly state that the gifts will end with the completion of the New Testament canon? So a person can know that all these monumental events and all these things that are going on in the book of Acts and all the teaching I have a in, bad in memory, a dozen so books in the New Testament are all going to go away when the New Testament's if you finished. A, yeah, if you ask Where a question and, and keep talking, I'm not going to remember. What was, the, what was the actual question that you asked? Where does the Bible plainly teach that the New Testament canon's completion would end the gifts where? In the same place that it teaches that a canon exists. It is scripturally deduced. Deduced. So nowhere. 
is what you're saying. Nowhere the, clearly is it stated. Nowhere clearly does the scripture teach that there will be a New Testament canon or what would make something, um, what would make the canon complete or when that ought to be done. These are things that were called scripturally deduced. This is the same way that uh, and, and Arian might, might argue against the deity of Christ or non-Trinitarian might argue uh, against a Trinitarian. Um, we would say some things have to be scripturally deduced. With the apostles, I think I, I did the best job I could in what short time I had to point out that the sign gifts, the charismatic gifts, were a part of the apostolate, attached to the apostolate, and by the laying on of hands uh, was passed on. We don't have the laying on of hands of apostles, and so we shouldn't assume that those charismatic sign gifts exist. Okay, uh, in Acts chapter 28, which is the end of Acts, and, and you stated earlier that um, the gifts were going away, they were dying out. Uh, we, ha we have a, an incident in Paul's life towards the end of his ministry. Can you recount to us what happens in the first nine verses of chapter 28? Of Acts? Yeah, we see some healings. What else do we see? Well, you tell me. We're leading, you're leading the cross-examination. I could preach to you a whole sermon in the minute and a half you have left if you want it. Well, you, you made a claim that the gifts were going away, even in Paul's life, and you just admitted here that... We, we certainly see a trend. That is what I was pointing out. We see that trend, yes. Well, at the end of Acts, you have Paul getting a number of people healed mm -hmm. on this island. He was also bitten by a snake and not injured. How is the miraculous power going away from his life when he survives a snake bite like nothing happened and a whole bunch of people get healed as a result? Where, how is that going away? Well, it's because we compare what we see in Acts to what we see in the epistles. We put one against another, and we see there is a gradual decrease of the charismatic gifting. Uh, not as though it goes away precisely in, in uh, the year 62, which was a figure I gave before, or perhaps the, the destruction of the temple in the year 70, but we see that decline. I mean, this is someone, again, who once was healing people by handkerchiefs and parts of his apron, and yet his best friends are sick and he can't, heal, he can't heal them. And by the way, this decline that we see in Scripture of the charismatic gifts is exactly what is told to us by the early church fathers, like Chrysostom and others, who claim that the gifts decreased as those died, those individuals who had hands laid upon them by the apostles. Isn't it true that the uh, later fathers who state that the gifts were dissipating gave reasons why, and those reasons were that the church was becoming carnal and worldly. Isn't that the reasoning they the, gave? The overwhelming testimony of the church fathers is not that the gifts dissipated because people were unfaithful. The overwhelming evidence from a preponderance of the church fathers, some of who disagreed, is that as the apostles departed and the canon was closed, there would be no more expectation to see such gifts. Uh, you use that term uh, Pentecost. I think you use the term Pentecostal power. Yes. And I understand the origin and the etymology of that term Pentecost referencing Acts chapter 2 and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But that's not the only place that we see such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, in the book of Acts. We see, uh, first of all, we'll start with Acts 2. In Acts chapter 2, what people group were receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit in that supernatural and miraculous way? 120 disciples of Jesus. Okay, and then on the day of Pentecost would be also an additional 3,000, correct? No, later, after Peter preached, 3,000 got saved. But they're, yes, they're being brought to faith. They're there. The outpouring is, is continuing. They're receiving the Holy Spirit, those who believe, yes, because you quoted it in that way. This promise is for you and for your children and so forth. Then we see Acts chapter 8, and what people group there is receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Samaritans. Okay, uh, then Acts chapter 10, we also see a similar outpouring. What people group is that? Italians. Yeah, that would be the God-fearing Grecians, those Gentiles who were proselytes to the faith. Then in Acts chapter 19, we see the last outpouring that is similar to what we saw in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 10. And what people group receives that outpouring? Ephesian disciples. Uh, Gentiles, like full-blown Gentiles, right? So we see four different Pentecosts, if I could use that word in Scripture. And all four of those in the book of Acts, where we see this type of phenomenon happened among a different people group. Uh, we see it among the Jews, the Samaritans, 
uh, who were kind of like half-breeds. Then we see it among the God-fearing Gentile proselytes and the Gentiles themselves. Do you find at all that there's something interesting there that every time this specific manifestation of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated and every time it's recorded for us in Scripture, it happens to a different people group perhaps signifying something differently, i.e. the Holy Spirit has come upon these people? And by people, I mean people group. That's exactly what I believe. The I, Holy I Spirit's think... coming upon the people and the manifestations of the Spirit are evident when he comes. The your, similar, similar things keep happening. Your argument, no matter any group they go to, that's what happens. Your argument is that that outpouring is for individuals, and that can be replicated, and we should expect that type of thing to happen in our life. What I'm asking you is, can you point to anything in Scripture where we're told to receive the type of outpouring that were first received upon the four Pentecosts of four different people groups in the book of Acts, so as to expect it to be normative today among people groups who've already had the Holy Spirit poured out upon them? I think I demonstrated a number of scriptures. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise of the Spirit is unto you, your children, all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the clear implication there is this gift of the Holy Spirit with the Pentecostal phenomena and the evidence that he fills people is what is to be expected. And the pattern okay. continues throughout the book of Acts. We have New Testament epistles written to churches giving us great explanations about tongues, their purpose in a local assembly, their purpose, whether you want to believe it or not, privately how it was prayed. Um, Ante, yeah, it's, it's assumed, like I told you, it's assumed everywhere. This is a Pentecostal group of people. Ante, I wasn't going to bring it up, but you brought up history twice. I didn't want to focus too much of the debate on church history. And you pointed out, uh, you mentioned 1,900 years. Like, we shouldn't expect um, 1,900 years of silence or however you phrase it, as though God hasn't been moving for 1,900 years. He left the church without this for 1,900 years, assuming that you're referring to the charismatic renewal that's happened in the last century. My question is, historically speaking, where on earth in the last 1,900 years do we see the type of behavior that is commonly promoted as normal among the charismatic movement? Where in church history do we see that happen? I don't know what you're talking about. Commonly, there are Speaking in tongues, uh, claims million, of healing. There are 500 million charismatic believers mm -hmm. right now all yep. over the earth. Right. Pentecostal charismatics are the global force in world missions. They are yeah. leading people to the Lord more than any other group. Well, there are, there are one billion I, Roman Catholics, so uh, you, know, you would agree that a lot of people can be wrong, yes? Uh, true, but my point is, is that since I haven't been around all 500 million of these people, I couldn't tell you what is normative, and I would also tell you that you have no idea what is normative. You, you are speaking in such generalities as if you're, you almost have omniscience. Okay. Um, let me ask you, uh, dunamai, you mentioned as being, well, you mentioned the term power, the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the word dunamai, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, when you say that word, power, are you referencing uh, what exactly? Is it the charismatic gifting, uh, tongues, or is it salvation? It's the influence of the Holy Spirit related to receiving his baptism. You okay. shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And there's, the a pattern of, wait, there's a pattern of use in Scripture. It's not exclusive. Words are used in a, in a variety sure. of ways, but you'll sure. find in the Bible that that word is often linked to demonstrable uh, sure. manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Would you say the dunamai of God in the Old Testament, which of course we understand this is a Greek word, but the power of God in the Old Testament was the same as the power of God in the New Testament? Well, the power of God in general, yes, but his manifestations uh, would be different. Uh, clearly, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was unique and different in a number of ways from what God had done previously, especially with enabling people to pray in other languages that mm. they did not know. This is unique. So there are new things God's doing. So you would say that you believe God can have just as much power even though he manifests that differently? God has all power. Yeah, but I ask a specific question. You believe that God has power, the same power, even though he chooses to manifest it differently? I guess, yes. He Between can, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes, he's clearly done that in certain respects. Right. So can God manifest his power now through things like, I don't know, the conversion of souls 
and, and people coming to repentant faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, he's doing that. As opposed to the various ways that we see it in the New Testament in which you therefore assume he must continue in that way today. No, it's not either or fallacy. It's both. He's doing all of that. Okay. Thank you. Minutes for each. We're going to start with Ante. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a book you might want to look at, 2,000 Years of Charismatic Church History. I believe his name was Eddie Hyde. If you want to see that the gifts of the Spirit continued on and there were groups and peoples that claimed throughout all 2,000 years of church history that the Holy Spirit was manifesting in the ways we see in the New Testament. You could read that. There are many other works. But what I want to share with you in regards to um, 1 Corinthians 13 especially is these following items. And I'm going to read some of this to you. It's getting late. I'm getting a little tired. I might need more coffee, but I'll share this with you. The anti-Nicene fathers came to believe... I'm going to list them to you, that certain false teachers were deluding their followers by misusing 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12, to their own advantage. These sectarians paraded their doctrines or their systems as the latter-day manifestation and fulfillment of the perfect. So there were people around in the New Testament at times and thereafter that were claiming the perfect is fulfilled in us and what we're teaching. The Orthodox Fathers all said that the perfect comes when Christ comes. And the groups that did this were the Montanists. The Montanists were claiming that the Holy Spirit had come down again, coming through people, particular people that they claimed were the paraclete, the comforter, and that they were now achieving this perfection that Paul had prophesied. So they were claiming, come join us, because the perfect is come. We have a better understanding, another Pentecost, so to speak, and we're it. Well, the response of um, the Orthodox Fathers was, this is false, and they appealed to 1 Corinthians 13 to say, there's no way this is going on because the perfect will come when Jesus comes, when we're raised from the dead, we'll have full understanding, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to understand. And they also accused these false teachers of pride, claiming and thinking that they could understand everything, the deep things, they, they knew it all, and, and the fathers were saying, no, we see through a glass darkly. We know in part now, even with the Bible. The rest we're going to know when Jesus comes back and we have resurrection bodies. So they used 1 Corinthians 13 to refute Gnostic heresies that indicated that they had this special perfect knowledge and to join them. They had been initiated into mysteries and things that no one else knew. The Montanists were making this claim and even some Arians claiming that they understood the Godhead better than everyone else and the fathers were all consistently using 1 Corinthians 13 to refute these three groups that were claiming it was being fulfilled historically in their time, and they all pointed to the future. And it wasn't until John Chrysostom who began to say, I think tongues and prophecies passed away. Uh, This is hundreds of years later, but I read in a historical account where he was having problems with his converts because they were expecting tongues and prophecy and the things to continue, and they were asking, why is this not happening? When we come and be baptized, it was expected. It was normative. It was what they were used to. And that's why he was having problems with with, with the people that he was pastoring. So, according to this one historian, over the first five centuries of the church, the exegetes of 1 Corinthians 13 broke into two camps. The sectarians who misused it to exalt their systems and heresies above the faith once delivered. And they went to great lengths to prove their knowledge fresher and perfect. The other were the successors of the apostolic churches who said this is fulfilled at the resurrection when Jesus comes back. So I'm going to quote some names to you of the people that were saying right after the apostles died and there on that 1 Corinthians 13 teaches the gifts end when Jesus comes back. Irenaeus, Origen, Methodius of Olympus, Eusebius of Caesarea, Didymus, Athanasius, Basilius, Gregory of Naz- I can't even say that. Nazanzus, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose, Apollinaris of Antioch, Jerome, Augustine, a man named Pseudo Justin Martyr, 
and Theodoret. So that, that's quite a group of people spread out throughout the empire, covering a period from about 150 A.D. into the 400s, and they're all saying that the gifts of the Spirit will end, according to 1 Corinthians 13, when Jesus comes back. That's a lot of evidence to overturn 15 or 16 or 1700 years later, like my opponent is trying to do in claiming that he knows better than all these men did. Further, he ran through a list of people that he said denied that the gifts continued. Now, I would challenge you to do your research because the following fathers, and this is not a complete list, most blatantly taught and asserted that the gifts of the Spirit were continuing into their day. You'll find it in the Didache, which is around 120 A.D., Clement of Rome, possibly 110 A.D., reference to gifts as continuing, the shepherd of Hermes, uh, eight, maybe A.D. 110, you know, these dates were, you know, historians are guessing around when they think these were written. Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian, Novation, Augustine, and even later the Venerable Bede in 601, there's an account of miracles happening in England and people were getting saved because of all the miracles that were taking place through the preaching. And so what I'm trying to tell you is this cessationist doctrine can be tested not only biblically and proven false. He has no scripture, nothing that says the canon is going to end the gifts. There's nothing like that. But when we look at the witnesses, we have historical evidence of the church that came after the apostles died. They, with one voice, are all asserting the gifts are continuing. And then when they appeal to 1 Corinthians 13, they're all saying, look, the heretics are the ones that are misusing this and are saying this is being fulfilled in history in 150 A.D. or 250 A.D., whenever, which is around the time he's saying it's being fulfilled or maybe a little later, 300 A.D. I don't know exactly when he's saying the gifts are ending, if it's the canon. When was the canon established? When the last thing was written or when the universal church, whatever that is, decided in the 300s what, what the New Testament books were? When exactly did the gifts end? Well, well, the uh, anti nicene fathers all said that these gifts and miracles continued. Some of them claimed the dead were still being raised. And so it's historically false unless all those men are liars. And now, 1,900 years later, the truth can be known. 1,900 years later. I'm not prepared to call all those men, many of whom sealed their fate and their testimony with their own blood, I'm not going to call them liars. I believe they were telling us the truth. The gifts of the Spirit continued. And they even told us biblically that this would continue. So I've moved this now forward, which I don't think I can dive into much more Scripture, but, but I will in, in a couple places. Um, history refutes cessationism. Straight up. If I'm going to use street language. Straight up refuted. There's no if, ands, or buts. When you appeal to history, the gifts of the Spirit are there for hundreds of years. And it's, the gifts of the Spirit would crop up now and again with different groups. If you study enough history, the gifts of the Spirit were appearing in churches in Europe long before 1904. And, and the woman that he mentioned in the 1800. And the further studying you do, the further you find that the gifts of the Spirit were always with the church. Sometimes hard to detect or, or, or uh, document, but I have tried to read and study and, and flesh this out. So I want to turn to um, Galatians chapter 3 and just read another passage that was not mentioned. There are many. The problem with a debate like this is, is my opponent went to talking about tongues. We could have a debate on tongues, but we could speak hours about what the Bible teaches on what tongues is and how you receive it and what Paul taught us about and what the other apostles. There is no way I could sit here now and refute, because I don't have time, all the things that he said about tongues and prophecy. It's really just a, a package deal. Either the gifts of the Spirit all passed away or they didn't. And I'm showing you from the Bible that the Bible clearly teaches a baptism in the Spirit after salvation, and there's phenomena and evidence associated with it. And the two things we see in the book of Acts, all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. When people got filled with the Holy Ghost, things happened. They spoke in tongues, they prophesied. It was evident, it was obvious. And Paul then took those um, things that happened to these believers, and he taught even more, especially to the Corinthians. He gave extensive teachings on the benefits of tongues. These are lies that the, the tongues and, and, and the spiritual gifts being exercised in Corinth was a sign of maturity. God's gifts, which were, which were all legitimate, 
in, in Corinth's day, unless he says they're all full of the devil. That's not a sign of immaturity. Their, their, their immaturity was not walking in love, their divisions, their factions. That's the immaturity and not considering one another. And Paul was trying to teach them simply how to operate the gifts better. To call the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit that the Corinthians were doing, that Paul plainly said they were doing by God, to call them all the things that he said and immature. To me, you want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? If someone wants to talk like a Pharisee opposing the work of God and the Spirit of God, to me this is textbook Phariseeism. This is not New Testament doctrine. Paul said no such things. Paul was excited at all the gifts of the Spirit that were being manifested in Corinth. He approached it like a father, like a teacher, like a shepherd. He tweaked them, he corrected them, and encouraged them to keep going. That's not what my opponent's doing. He's denigrating the gifts of the Spirit, even in Paul's day, and denigrating what God's been doing since. It's not biblical. In Galatians 3, Paul says this. Have you ever pondered this? O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently sent, set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? What does that mean? Received ye the Spirit. See, there is a reception of the Holy Spirit. Then he says this, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? They were going back to the law. That's the flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? Verse 5, He that ministers to you the Spirit, capital S, and works miracles among you, doesn't say anything about apostles. It's unnamed people. What does this mean, he that ministers the Spirit to you? What does that mean? What does it mean to minister the Holy Spirit to somebody? Salvation? No. He's ministering the Holy Spirit, and he's working miracles amongst them. See, this is common. Cessationists can't make sense of this. All they can do is offer explanations and, and, and really mostly irrelevant remarks. But the simple fact of the matter that in Galatia there were people that were ministering the Spirit. It was done by faith. They were ministering the Holy Spirit to people. And they were working miracles. And this is normative. He just kind of brings it up in passing and saying, look, you got baptized into this. The Holy Spirit is moving. You received Him by faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He manifests in your presence by faith through people that minister Him to to you and work miracles why would you now go anti-faith and back under the law you're under the spirit ponder that passage there's no good explanation from a cessationist Get to uh, discuss history after all. My opponent recommended uh, to you a book. I'll recommend one to you as well, and that would be Conyers Middleton, A Free Inquiry into the Miraculous Powers, which are supposed to have subsisted in the Christian Church from the earliest of ages through several successive centuries. And yes, that is the whole title uh, to the book. Now, he wanted you to read a book about the history of the charismatic church, and it, it, just as Providence would have it tonight, I actually happen to have a history of the charismatic church here, if you'd like to hear it. Uh, first, there were the Montanists. They were not Montanists, and they were not condemned because they had a, an interpretation specifically of, of 2 Timothy chapter 3. No, they were Montanist heretics, uh, anathematized from the church, because they called it the new prophecy heresy, or the cataphrygian heresy, but it was often known by that colloquialism. You got new prophecy, you got a problem, because now you're out of the church. Then we have the Roman Catholic Church, which is always built upon its doctrines of ridiculous claims. Then you have next, it's actually quite a bit of a jump in church history. The Knievel prophets, these were French Huguenot spinoffs and heretics. Then you have the Jansenists who opposed sola fide. They were condemned by both Protestants and, and um, Roman Catholics. Uh, then you have the Quakers. That's where we see it begin to, that is charismaticism, lift its ugly head uh, in recent history, started by, Jar, uh, the, by George Fox. They traded sola scriptura for an inner light, ended up abandoning sola scriptura and the sufficiency of scripture as charismatics always do. Then you have the Irving Knights. Now, these were an interesting bunch of people. Scotch Presbyterians who started, actually, the Catholic Apostolic Church renouncing Protestantism and Presbyterianism along with it. Then we have the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists. I could go on and on. Virtually every known heresy under the sun does not come to us by people who say, I believe in the Scripture and the Scripture alone, and that is enough. 
No, what it brings to us is every known heresy under the sun and 500 million people who are of a wicked and a perverse generation who seeketh after signs and follow into the prosperity gospel, a oneness Pentecostalism, and every form of aberrant theological deviation that one can imagine. You see, charismatics today proclaim miracles wholly unlike the signs and wonders that were done in the apostolic age, both in their weakness and in their temporary nature, also in their overall lameness, complete with hearsay and absent of documentation. Rather than signs and wonders being so impressive in the New Testament that they were faith-inducing, today's charismatic signs and wonders are so pathetic they take faith to believe in. Their miracles don't give faith, they require naivety. Likewise, charismatic tongues today, uh, uh, that is the xenoglossia, excuse me, is not the xenoglossia that's demonstrated in Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 8, but it is ecstatic utterance, which, by the way, you'll find this in every history book I've ever looked at. All of the church fathers and the patristic fathers that came later, even though some of them disagreed about certain gifts, in other words, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus claimed to hear about certain charismatic things done, but they never could quite point out exactly who was raised from the dead or what language that was exactly. What's interesting is they all condemned ecstatic utterance, every single last one, even though there was some varying opinions about other issues. You see, that supposed gift of the modern charismatic movement, which is more akin to a curse than a gift, is demonstrated expressly against the protocol set forth in Scripture, commonly in private or in public without interpretation, chaotically and out of order all at once. Their prophecies are errant, their prophets are fallible, their revelations are vague, their predictions range from nebulous to absurd and serve nothing but to bring to the church confusion, doubt, and disbelief. If anything, I assert that the lack of discernment, which is listed among spiritual gifts, is a sure sign that the Holy Spirit does not abide in the modern charismatic movement. Consider its leaders. Now, I would argue the lack of spiritual discernment in that movement is a sign that that movement is under the judgment of God because even the most basic discernment is almost utterly lacking from today's charismatics, supernaturally blinded to the eyes of, of all reason. The satanic level of blindness to all truth and reason has led the charismatic movement to accept the heresies of the word of faith, little God theology, the prosperity gospel, oneness Pentecostalism, gross ecumenism with papists and with heretics, and overall every wicked teaching under the sun. As church fathers like Eusebius denied the signs and wonders of the Montanist as fraudulent because he supposed that God would not endorse heresy by making real signs and wonders performed by heretics, Whereas the reformers denied the signs and wonders of the Roman church because they supposed that God would not make a vial of Mary's breast milk work miracles only to promote Roman Catholic idolatry, we should only assume that God has no purpose in working signs and miracles and wonders only to promote the word of faith, oneness, prosperity-driven, new apostolic reformation, third-wave miracle-mongering of modern charismatics. Signs and wonders accompanied the giving of God's law through Moses. Signs and wonders accompanied the giving of God's prophecy through Elijah and Elisha. And these accompanied the giving of the gospel through Jesus and the apostles. So if we have no new scripture, we need no new miracles. On the other hand, you show me where people are claiming new prophecy, and I'm going to show you a heresy. And I'm going to show you a heresy really fast. I've already given a survey of the gradual cessation of the apostolic sign gifts from Acts uh, to the epistles as seen in the pages of the New Testament, but let me give one more. From 430 BC, approximately the time of Malachi's prophecy to John the Baptist, there was more than 400 years of utter and complete cessation. Jewish sources like the Babylonian Talmud acknowledge that, quote, when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi died, the Holy Spirit departed Israel. Until prophecy began to be reignited with the New Testament scriptures, like John the Baptist, for example, and eventually Christ, God was silent. We all agree with this. This was the cessation of prophecy that was prophesied by Amos in the Old Testament. In Amos chapter 11, verse 12, he writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They'll run to and fro. They'll seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. The cessation is even prophesied in the Old Testament during that intertestamental period. Uh, first, Maccabees, which is not a book of the Bible that we would consider to be biblical, but Roman Catholics would take it as canonical knowledge for whatever that's worth, which means it's probably wrong, but for what it's worth, it says in First uh, Maccabees 9.27, there was great distress in Israel such as had not been since that time that the prophets ceased to appear among them. 
It seemed to have been universally recognized among almost everyone that something changed. God stopped speaking. God stopped doing signs and wonders to validate his prophets because there were no prophets because God had said everything he wants to say. So if someone says validate the scripture, to me I say Jesus Christ is the son of God and he rose from the dead. What else do you need? We have the scripture and we have the miracles attested to us in scripture and faith doesn't come by seeing but faith comes by believing by believing in our heart that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Similarly, if, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8, it would only make sense that if God stopped speaking when the Old Testament canon was complete, he stopped speaking when the New Testament canon was complete. Likewise, if God stopped authenticating prophets with signs and wonders when there were no prophets, one would only suggests that he would do the same today again now that the New Testament canon has been made complete. This is the very reason why the author of Hebrews speaks of the cessation of prophecy as he begins in chapter 1 of verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers through the prophets but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. Now, charismatics might point out that this verse must not mean what it plainly says because the author of Hebrews was writing scripture prophetically at the time that he was writing that very sentence. Such an argument, though, misses the forest for the trees, unfortunately. The point is, everything given to us in the scripture, everything given to us by the apostles was given to us not by the apostles. Everything given to us by the apostles was not by the apostles. It was actually by Jesus through the apostles. And so everything that we see from end to amen, from beginning to the end, from, from Matthew to Revelation, whether said by apostle or prophet or a little bit of both, all of that is really the words of Jesus Christ, inspired by the thrice holy God. And so this is how Jesus speaks to us. This is how the Spirit speaks to us. Everything that the apostles wrote from, from the, the, the time of Jesus onward was in fact the words of Jesus. And so those Bibles that you see in which the words of Jesus are written in red, really, in fact, it's all inspired of God. Every word should be in red. And so Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 was chosen by God to preserve his canonical revelation that God now speaks to us through the words of Christ. Now the question is, if you believe that prophecy can be wrong and you believe that prophecy is the word of the Holy Spirit, my question is, what kind of Holy Spirit do you believe in exactly? That Holy Spirit had the dunamai and power to make an Old Testament prophet get the prophecy right in the Old Testament, but now the dunamai in the New Testament doesn't have the power to get the New Testament, New, New Testament prophet, prophet, excuse me, prophet to spit it out? That was ironic, wasn't it? <laughs> this cessational transition continues to, I did that on purpose, to be spoken of, not really, by the author of Hebrews as he mentions the miracles and signs and wonders that were past tense, performed by Jesus and the apostles. He said, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness, past tense, by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. According to the author of Hebrews, Jesus and the apostles declared salvation and God bore witness, past tense to it, by signs and wonders and various miracles. And that is all that we need because the foundation has already been laid according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Now here's the fact. No one in 1900 years of human history, not one, has demonstrated the signs of a true apostle, signs, wonders, and who preached a biblical gospel and was simultaneously a man of virtue and holiness. There were many who made such claims, all unsubstantiated and unimpressive. Modern uh, leaders of the modern charismatic movement have been one train wreck after another because why they're not of God. It's here that I have to do my job as a gospel preacher in the last minute of the debate where I, it would be remiss of me not to spare what precious time I have that remains to give you the gospel. The gospel which has been given to us as of first importance is that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures that he was buried, and according to the scriptures, he rose again. God the Father has chosen some to eternal life, and those are the ones for whom Jesus came to die. And those God chose, and those for whom Jesus died, the Holy Spirit will convict of sin. The Holy Spirit will quicken their conscience, regenerate their heart, call them effectually, grant them repentance, give them spiritual gifts, grow them in sanctification, produce in them spiritual fruit. And all of these things, the Holy Spirit has the busiest of schedules of any of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. And without his active work among men, even to this very day, we would all perish. 
And without the Holy Spirit's active work among men, even to this day, we would die in our trespasses and sins. So then might we be thankful for what the Holy Spirit has given in the word and what the Holy Spirit continues to do. Well, if the gifts of the Spirit are given by God, they're from God. It's judging the stewarding of the gifts. The uh, Corinthians were um, not considering their brother in, in the operation of the gifts, and Paul instructed them. You need to, you know, the whole love chapter is given sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 in relation to uh, rightly uh, operating the spiritual gifts or letting them manifest and to be loving and considerate. And he said, excel to edify the brethren. Don't just think about yourself. You, he said, praying in tongues edifies you. The man who prays in tongues edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And really your concern, if you're walking in love, is for the benefit and blessing of your brother over and above yourself. So it's the stewarding or the poor stewarding that really has to be judged or corrected, and I think that's what Paul did. Okay. And I, I meant to say this earlier before we start with that, uh, for both the speakers, if you guys keep uh, comments as short as you can, we got a lot of questions to see if we can get through them all. How long? Like 30 seconds, a minute? As long as the you short. need, but okay. as concise as we can be. Uh, JD, the first question for you. Uh, JD, how do you distinguish between apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors if apostles and prophets have ceased, why not the other three? Good question. It's because when we look at a systematic theology of, of the scripture, we see that the apostles were tied intrinsically to the prophets uh, in a way that is unique and not like the way that they were tied intrinsically to teachers and pastors and so forth. So the place that I would turn to to answer that would be Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, which mention apostles and prophets together as the foundation of the church, not pa pastors, teachers, evangelists. Furthermore, um, no one needed to have hands laid upon them in order for them to teach or in order for them to be an elder in the church or in order for them to evangelize. The laying on of hands was done for the sake of that, that apostolic um, sign gift. And we see in scripture that what accompanied that was signs uh, like tongues, Miracles, wonders, mighty deeds. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm taking about six or seven questions that came in and trying to summarize them into about two. Uh, so I'm going to open this, I guess, really for both of you, but some of them were more specific to you. Um, so, Ante, the first one actually was for you. It says, is, is it necessary for salvation to be baptized in the name of Jesus only? Speaking water baptism. No, I wouldn't make that claim. And then this is where we get into several of them that we're asking, and I'll open it up for both, is this issue of um, is, and I'm summarizing several of them, putting them together, but do you believe someone that does not demonstrate the gifts, are they unsaved? Or another way of putting it is, do you believe that speaking in tongues is evidence of regeneration and necessary for salvation? Sorry, no, I think I laid out the case very clearly that that's not, not the case. I, salvation is one experience, and baptism in the Holy Spirit is another. Uh, conversion, initiation, and spirit baptism is the pattern you see throughout the New Testament. Okay, I get, let me re rephrase the question again so it's clear. Uh, do you believe that speaking in tongues is evidence then of baptism then? Uh, that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, I do. Okay. You're, One of the evidence. Do you believe, in, and I'm going to ask it a different way for you, J.D., do you, do you believe baptism of the Spirit is necessary for salvation? Yes. Baptism okay. of the Holy Spirit is necessary for salvation. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part and parcel of conversion. As a matter of fact, I mean, to be baptized means to be to be immersed. Amen, Baptists? Presbyterians. <laughs> um, and so we, we are to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. The question is, it, it is if it is a secondary event, as they believed in the primarily the first and second wave of the Pentecostal movement or charismatic movement, uh, or if it is one and the same, and I would stand with the church historic and say it's the same event, because not all the time in Scripture 
particularly as the narratives are given in the book of Acts, do we see this as two different events? We see it in two different events, only four different times, dealing with the unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon four different unique people groups, not to individuals, but to people groups to signify to the Jews the Holy Spirit has come to them. Okay, so follow-up then question, uh, Ante, um, based on what you had said. Um, if you believe that baptism, that speaking in tongues is a sign of baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, why does 1 Corinthians 12 differ? Well, if you study it out or, or look at the um, Assemblies of God position, um, they believe there is a uh, private manifestation of tongues that accompanies spirit baptism, which you see in the book of Acts. They get filled with the Holy Ghost. They speak with tongues. But publicly, there is a manifestation. Paul says there's diversities of, of operations and administrations. For example, in, in a Pentecostal service, you would, you would find people that would stand up and utter a message in tongues, and either they would then interpret in a known language or someone else would. And that was considered a public ministry, like apostle, prophet, teacher. Not everyone has that or can do that. Not everyone has a ministry, which Paul says tongues and interpretation is the equivalent of prophecy, which, which edifies, builds up, and comforts God's people. Not everyone can do that. But that doesn't mean that you can't pray in tongues privately. It just does not mean that the Holy Spirit will quicken every believer <laughs> to stand up in a service and speak in tongues and interpret. That service would go on forever. So that, that ministering to God's people, the, whole, the Holy Spirit decides who's going to do that, and it's a few. Okay, from my own follow-up to understand, so you're saying that you believe 1 Corinthians 12 is regarding the church alone, not... Yeah, because he mentions apostles, prophets, teachers, you know, so he's talking about ministry gifts, things that are that are being done in a more official capacity. Okay, J.D., please briefly explain why believers in the early chapters of Acts did not immediately receive the Spirit upon belief versus your position now that they do, indeed, that the Spirit is required for regeneration and the new birth. Uh, I, I was with you up until that last phrase. Can you see that last bit again? Um, that says, uh, versus your position now, that they do, indeed, that the Spirit is required for regeneration and the new birth. Oh, uh, got you. Yeah, well, I really don't know if, if that is um, contested. The Spirit is necessary for regeneration and new birth by Ante or myself. So let me answer the first part of that question as best that I understand it. Yeah, it's very simple. Uh, it is because the apostles were the foundation of the church, the representatives of Christ on earth. And so we see the apostles being symbolic, um, and, and more than symbolic, but in a very real sense, being the church, um, it was important for people to recognize their authority. Now, in Acts chapter 2, it did come upon conversion. It was immediate. But in Acts chapter 8, if you remember, Philip is dispatched and, and the gospel comes to the Samaritans and then they wait for Peter to get there. And Peter lays hands upon them and they receive the gift, signifying the authority of the church that it should come with, the, that, that the authority of the apostles is the authority of Christ himself. And then we see that happen twice more in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 19. Again, it was signifying the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon individual groups of people. And then on top of that, they were bringing evidence back to the Jews in Jerusalem. Remember, I read to you two verses that says speaking in tongues is a sign for unbelievers, and particularly for unbelieving Jews. And they said, hey, these guys spoke in tongues, so they received salvation. And so in Acts chapter 8, when this happens among the Samaritans, Peter, at the household of Cornelius, baptizes them after asking the church, is, does anybody have a reason why I shouldn't? Then he has to go back in the next chapter uh, to uh, Jerusalem and explain himself. And his defense is, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit in this way, proving to the unbelieving Jews that this was a legitimate act of God. Okay, uh, I'm going to kind of rephrase this question for you, Ante, because it, it assumes a position you have, so I first want to ask that. Uh, do you believe that 1 Corinthians 13.1 teaches that men can speak the language of angels? I don't see any reason why Paul would say that if it wasn't so. Okay. So then the follow-up is, do you, do you also believe that Paul 
has all knowledge and is omniscient, as the next verse says, and can remove all mountains. No, he's clearly going into hypothetics to hy hypotheticals to make a point, uh, hyperbole or extreme, to stress the importance of love. If you, even if I had all of that, what good would it do if I didn't walk in love? So wouldn't verse one also be hypothetical? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Is there anything? Why, why, why couldn't he just say, if I could speak in, in every language humanly on earth, then why, why invoke, you know, the tongues of angels? Obviously, angels can talk to people. There's a language or languages in heaven. We don't, we don't know exactly. No one can say, really, I don't think anyone can say whether or not some tongues are angelic or not. Um, I wouldn't fight over it. There's no way to prove it. Could be the same. Hi, Bob. Do you have a response? Yeah, I can say it. Um, angels speak human languages. Uh, so when Paul references, I speak in the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, he's talking about a lofty oration, which was very popular among the, among the Grecians of his day and in Greco-Roman culture, giving fine orations. He was talking about how he spoke, not what language he spoke necessarily, but the way that he spoke. Now let me demonstrate that to you a couple of different ways. First of all, in Isaiah, uh, when he sees uh, the throne room of God and the angels encircling the throne, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Isaiah wasn't like, is there a translator? Uh, he was in the throne room of God, hearing angels speak in heaven, and he knew what they were saying. Furthermore, we turn to the Old Testament and see, hey, angels converse with humans without a translator. Uh, that means that angels speak human languages, but there's one more. And that is, you know how charismatics argue that the gift of tongues will cease when the perfect comes in heaven? If the speaking of tongues is a heavenly language, which I call ecstatic gobbledygook, my question is, how does that heavenly language disappear once we go to heaven? What are we doing there? Sign language? How does that happen? So he can't be speaking of the tongues of angels unless that too will cease when we get to heaven. We don't say get to heaven. I just want to put that out. I've made it very clear when Jesus comes back. So this is a straw man. You know, you can refute something we don't believe and make it look absurd. That's not what I was saying. I think you all heard me lay out the case that this will cease when Jesus comes back, not when we get to heaven. Does that mean when everyone dies, the gifts cease for take, us? Take it everything. means nothing. Take They're all going to end at the same time, simultaneously at a certain event, not when we get to heaven, whatever that means. There's millions of people in heaven now. Right. So you can feel free to take out the word heaven and replace that with the eschaton, but then that would simply be a distinction without any form of substance. substance the return of Jesus to earth. Or difference, rather. No, I'm saying the return of Jesus to earth. I'm not saying either one of those things that you're saying, and neither do any Pentecostals that I know. Andrew? You got a referee, man. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't think there was need to. Those. You're in the middle for a reason. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the question, uh, we'll start. Actually, this is for both of you, but we'll start with you on. All right. So if there is a continued new revelation from God, uh, is it not logical to conclude that nobody could ever disagree whatsoever? And if I disagree, I'm calling that person a liar or that God is wrong? No, based on what we read in the New Testament. If prophecies have to be judged, then that's not the case. It just goes away. The objection goes away. It's speaking about the gifts of the Spirit in an absolute way authoritative way that you don't find taught in the New Testament. So to me, it's a non-objection. It, it, it's not logical. It's not that. Agabus, when he prophesied, began it with, thus says the Lord. So to claim that we don't see that type of prophecy and its authority in the New Testament, like we do in the Old Testament, is not an accurate statement. You don't begin a prophecy by saying, thus says the Lord. In Wayne Grudem's work on this subject, he said modern day prophets might want to say something along the lines of, the Lord of God, I, or excuse me, the Lord God has led me, I think, to believe that this is true. That's not how Agabus prophesied. He said, thus says the Lord. That seems pretty, uh, that, that seems pretty authoritative to me. And so, of course, I would argue that nothing changes between the New and Old Testament when it comes to prophecy. It's not the only okay. example. 
All right, so uh, uh, Ante, for you, the next question is, how do you explain the ability of other religions to speak in tongues, seeing how they are not filled with the Holy Spirit? Other religions have prophets. Other religions have soothsayers. Other religions have people that apparently can sometimes predict things or read omens. Demon power. Demons know a lot. There is a kingdom on this earth that's described by Paul, kingdom of darkness, and they have been observing humanity and observing us and harassing us, and they know a lot. They could probably guess many things and tell people what's going to happen or what they're going to do, but it's clearly a demon power, but you could pretty much ascribe anything that we do uh, or bring it into question because there's some kind of parallel in false religions. I mean, they pray, they worship. I mean, do we throw that out because other religions do it? Yeah, I would say uh, other, uh, other religions, uh, by definition, false religions and cults don't speak in tongues. They don't. What I mean by that is tongues means language, back to what the term glossa means. What they do is ecstatic gobbledygook. They don't do languages. They just speak nonsense words and syllables that mean nothing. Which we might follow in well to the next question. Um, it is a multi-part question, but uh, some of them yes, no. So does Ante speak in tongues? I do. If so, what earthly slash ethnic languages uh, have you spoken? I don't know. Do speak? It's unknown tongue to the speaker. It's unknown to me. Does he know? I'll get through them then. Does, does he know of the languages of any in his congregation? I don't really listen when they're praying under their breath. We're, we're careful to follow 1 Corinthians 14. Okay. Do they have interpreters? We have had tongues interpreted in our services. I've seen it in other states and other churches that I've been at. I've seen tongues and interpretation given forth. Always or just sometimes? No, well, sometimes no one gets up and speaks in tongues. Right. Ante just defended ecstatic utterance by referring to it as unknown tongue. In his King James Bible, he will see that the word unknown is in italics because it is not there in the Greek. It is added by the translators. It is other tongues. This is what we might call heteroglossia, not glossolalia. Unknown tongue is eisegeted into the text of Scripture. Can I address okay. that? The verse. Uh, no, because I do want to try to move okay. on if, if we can. So, JD, why can't gifts affirm or give strength to the fact that Christianity is true? Well, the, the gifts certainly had secondary and tertiary purposes, didn't they? As I said uh, in one of my talks, um, the gifts might have served purposes, and we see it in Scripture, of edification or of, of comfort. I mean, healing the sick is certainly an act of compassion. But they had a primary purpose. The primary purpose was as a sign to signify something. And so the point being, without its primary purpose, there's no secondary purpose. The primary purpose has to come first. Um, when Jesus healed people, it wasn't only to heal the lame. It was to point to his messiahship. And I could go through miracle by miracle by miracle in the New Testament. We don't have time to do that. Um, and, and demonstrate that never was a secondary purpose uh, of compassion or edification, um, the reason for the primary reason for a miracle uh, or sign and wonder being performed, it was the signifying act itself that was primary. Okay. Uh, are you sinning if you get a word of God and do not obey it? If it's truly a word from the Lord, yes. Yeah, and there's 66 books of it. Okay. Um, this next one, I'm. I almost want to criticize or, or uh, make comment about the way someone worded this, but this came up three times, is asking uh, basically the same question. Do you believe that Christians who uh, have been baptized in the Spirit could drink deadly poison and not be harmed? That's what the Bible says. If they not go do it and tempt the Lord, if they do, we have a promise of protection. 
if you understand or, or do a little study of uh, missionary work and evangelism, especially in the first century and in many places now, very dangerous. Many perils, toils, and snares to go bring the gospel to people and the possibility of drinking something deadly or poison accidentally or deliberately put in was a very real thing. And so the Lord had that covered, as he did with the fear of serpents and scorpions that God would protect. And we saw in Acts 28, the end of the book, that Paul was impervious to a snake bite and healed a whole bunch of people there, proving that the gifts were not going away and they were not diminishing in Paul's life at all. Jordan, do you believe that sensa uh, do, do sensationists... you got to let me answer that. Okay, go for it. Okay. To um, be fair. Okay, at first I did try to avoid the argument about the longer ending of Mark, but but here I go. There's more than just one time, uh, type of continuationist. I did neglect to mention one, and that is Peter Ruckman. Um, he, he, of course, an advocate of King James onlyism, uh, basically said that, I think I have the exact quote here, um, Oh, he wrote a book entitled Correcting the Greek with English, arguing that if the King James says it, um, and we don't find that to be the most accurate translation, that you can consider it essentially delayed revelation, new revelation that has been given after the close of the canon. That's a form of continuationism, and so I would urge people to do a little bit of textual criticism and ask themselves, given those particular verses, do those belong in the text of Scripture? Okay. Can I address that since he brought it up? We have 33 we, yeah. seconds less That's, left, and I'll be yeah. happy to give you the last word, Dante. The vast majority of Greek manuscripts have the ending of Mark. They're in other translations, Syriac, Italic, the Latin Vulgate. There's only a few that don't have it, and they are hundreds of years later. You have church fathers referring to the ending of Mark 150 years before the two manuscripts that don't have it was written, which means it was in their text, and they quoted it as if it was part of the Bible. There was not a question. So it is part of your Bible. Don't worry. Don't let the devil come and steal the word. That's what he does. He comes to steal the word. Uh, okay, so real quick. We're going to try and knock these last ones out quickly. So, Jordan, do you, do you believe that sensationists, or, or do sensationists believe... Sensationists? Sens thank you. Believe I'm not that a sensationalist. <clears throat> That's him. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, do you believe that kidding. God can still heal uh, people's infirmities today? If so, if so, how? How does he choose? Yeah, God can do whatever he wants today. Yeah, God God heals people. That's different than the gift of healing imparted to an individual. And then uh, for you, Ante, and this was there were several in here on this one, is but this basically sums them up. If if one has the gift of healing today, would it be immoral not to go to St. Jude's? And every other hospital to empty them out well that assumes that you can heal at will and, and anybody you want whenever you want some of the examples cited show that Paul who often healed many or all the people that came to him could not get certain people healed which means you cannot get everyone healed um, in um, Mark chapter 6 and Matthew 13 Jesus came to certain cities and it said he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief now, that statement bothers a lot of people because it puts responsibility back on human beings, but it flatly says that Jesus could do no mighty work. He could not do it because of their unbelief. So it's not so simple as people want to paint it as, oh, you have the gift of healing, it's automatic, go heal everyone. I would love if that was so. I would go to the hospital and clear it out. I'd, I'd spend the rest of my days clearing out hospitals if I could. Yeah. Uh, you might notice how charismaticism, in order to defend what it is that they do, end up attacking the impressiveness of what the New Testament authors did in the apostles. That passage doesn't say that Jesus tried to do no work, uh, tried to do works, but could not. It wasn't as though he tried. There is no, uh, there is no kinetic energy on the part of Jesus directed towards those who were being healed. Probably what people um, have typically interpreted that to mean is that people were not bringing to Jesus people that needed to be healed. As the healing began, swarms and multitudes of people would bring Jesus uh, those who uh, they wanted to be healed. If you remember, the man brought through the roof by his friends. This wasn't happening. They didn't believe, and he just moved on to the next town. Okay, two, two questions left. This, this next one will be for you from me. So, right. uh, so here's going to be the question. Um, you've, you've made the distinction between salvation and baptism of the Spirit. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament and just say that from a Jewish perspective, that is a foreign concept. 
Ezekiel 36, which is the promise of the new covenant. So if you want to take a look at it, I'll read it. Ezekiel uh, 36, starting in verse 26, which is talking of the promise of the new covenant, being with the sign of the Holy Spirit, of the baptismal Holy Spirit, says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and, and be careful to obey my rules. This is something in, in an Old Testament. The promise of the New Test, uh, the promise of the New Covenant, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was a sign of salvation to the Jews. Uh, this is something that. I, so the question is, how do you make a distinction when the Old Testament does not? Well, I wouldn't say it doesn't. It, it, it clusters a number of promises together, but that doesn't mean they aren't consecutive. They're listed consecutively in a certain order and. You know, the coming of Jesus, first and second coming, appear to be clustered together, and yet we find out in the New Testament it separates the two coming. He, he first had to come to suffer, and then he would come again in glory and reign. They're separated, but in the, New, in the Old Testament, this was the objection of the Jews, is when the Messiah comes, he's supposed to bring peace on the earth and rule and exalt Israel as a nation again, and that didn't happen. And the New Testament informs us that it's because there's two comings. In the same way, you see the New Testament clearly make a distinction between the new birth being born again, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To me, as quickly as I could, I tried to lay out the case that not the same language, terms, not the same effects. They're clearly different, and I tried to rightly divide. And I'm not surprised the Old Testament clusters things together that the new begins to spread out as we get understanding. You don't respond to that at all? Okay. Last question, and I'll be for both of you. I'll start with you. Go ahead and give him the last word. Yep. Uh, but I think this is a good final question. Is there a line, and if so, where is it that which each, at which each are holding um, the other? Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to reword this. Is there a line in which you think that the other side is a salvation issue? Uh, yeah, definitely, because the Holy Spirit leads us to the knowledge of truth. And so when I see the vast majority of those uh, 500 million uh, charismatics, most of whom have fallen for the prosperity gospel and teach all sorts of aberrant things, I, I have no choice but to worry for their soul. Likewise, again, we come to the issue of spiritual discernment. If the spirit of discernment was in charismatic churches, I don't know that Todd Bentley and Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Meyer, I mean, I could literally be here all day, would be the most popular charismatic teachers out there. And there's one other issue, and that is what it deals with at its heart is the sufficiency of Scripture. When we start denying the sufficiency of Scripture, you will chase headlong into error every time. And all I have to do to demonstrate that is show you the last 100 years of the charismatic renewal. No one denies Scripture. I am a sola scriptura man. I've tried to make my case from the Bible. And that's where I'd make it from. The idea that we don't do that is absurd and just not true. It's interesting that he brought up Todd Bentley. I live in the area where uh, he came up to Morningstar with Rick Joyner and other people that we are very concerned about. Uh, they are aberrant and off and carnal. Well, when he dumped his wife for the younger intern and we found out that Rick Joyner was going to try to restore him, I knew that we were going to have to publicly go and confront that man. And I waited and prayed, and nine months later, when Rick Joyner tried to perpetrate a fraud on what I view as our Pentecostal charismatic people of restoring Todd Bentley, who was an unrepentant adulterer and did not go back to his wife and kids, but instead married his intern, 30 or 40 of us were there to confront him. And when he got up to speak, we got up one after another and began to rebuke him and call him a false prophet and tell him to go back to his wife and that he was still in adultery and that he needed to repent. We rebuked all the proceedings. We were thrown out one at a time as we did this. In the providence of God, we did not know that Oprah Winfrey was going to be there because they were doing a uh, uh, documentary on the Lakeland revival. So they filmed all of this. There was another group. Did you protest her too? Because that would have been pretty cool. Who, Oprah? Yeah. I, I didn't know I didn't know who all the people oh, with the cameras were. But there, 
well, I would love to, but there were two groups <laughs> there filming and doing documentaries. And so we were interviewed afterwards. Why are you here? Why did you disrupt this church service? Well, I had nine months to pray on it. And, and through a whole series of events where leaders and pastors from across the country just happened to be in Charlotte at the same time that Rick Joyner was going to spring this nonsense with, uh, with uh, Todd Bentley upon the charismatic body of Christ. God made sure we were there to rebuke him, confront him, put it on video, and it has hurt that group, and, and people left. I mean, I've heard good things. Not everyone has, has left there, but his uh, influence, his ability to deceive within our ranks was blunted, and I believe it, it was the providence of God that you brought that up. There's a lot of stories like that I could tell you. You just don't know that uh, there are Pentecostal charismatic people who earnestly contend for the faith, who confront people in doctrinal and moral heresy, and will do it publicly if necessary. Do you, do you think there's a line where this is a salvific, salvific issue? Well, that, that was the original question. Okay. Well, so what? do you think there's a line on this on this issue with the continuation or not uh, that it makes it a salvation issue? Well. If Someone's born again and they love Jesus. I'm, I'm happy. I'd like to see them enter into the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. That's what Paul called it. If they don't, they don't. Um, I, I would caution my brother over here with his rhetoric, bombastic ad hominems. Basically, he's writing all the Pentecostals and Charismatics out of the kingdom of God and ascribing whatever manifestations are happening to the devil or whatever. I find his... Um, language very troubling and there is a point where you have to consider if i'm right and god is moving in the midst of his people whether they got it all together or not corinth didn't have it all together and a man comes in and begins to call that all of the devil and false and not true we have a warning from the lord jesus christ about people who would do that and um i see a recklessness here in the descriptions of what i believe and what i've experienced and, and those 500 million around the world that to me is textbook Phariseeism and and yeah I I think that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is is something Tell you that what, we if better you can watch perform out. a miracle right now for us I'll totally totally believe that what you just said was the Word of God I'm glad you said that because you you challenged me just like the Pharisees and and the unbelievers in Jesus day challenged him and he said okay. the kind of people who say that stuff are, are of a wicked okay, and perverse so I'm, and adulterous I'm gonna, I'm gonna, generation so thank you for manifesting what I just so, said. So the spirit you speak well, hold from. Hold on. I'm going to just because we're now getting off because it wasn't the question. I actually thought you were going to answer that question because you did it. You did well earlier with you and I when we were talking. Sure. Even though that wasn't, I didn't know that question was coming up. I thought. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I would say, but, if you go there, you're asking yeah. for trouble. I do want to, I do want to thank each of the men here. Um, I do want to thank you guys for attending. This is clearly, uh, yeah, probably in some people's minds, it is not convinced you at all. Um, in other people's minds, maybe it's giving you some more food for thought. That's the, the hope. Uh, the, the thing that is, is that uh, we do want to ask that you guys would give an appreciation to both men, whichever side you agreed with or not. So if you wouldn't. <laughs> for those who don't know what it's like to prepare for a debate, both men have taken a lot of time and, and put this together. And with that, we're, we're going to dismiss, but I do need to let you know